Me and I was sitting in the back and I just said, you know, God just helped me to convey this because he said, I'm not the recent thing that he's given me for the last really month or so. Um, I was ministering uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, maybe almost a month ago, and I was getting ready to go to church and, and, and just some things that, you know, God is doing with me and, and everybody's, you know, saying, you know, wow, you know, you, you look different in the whole nine yards. And so he had me... Um, you know, not eating any meat and just really purifying and drinking water and no sodas and no desserts and all that, you know, just really getting myself cleansed. And so I felt like, you know, wow, you know, I, I really feel like, you know, I'm just woo, like I'm, I'm alive again. And he spoke to me in the hotel room and literally just literally knocked me off on the floor in tears. And he said, now you need a new heart. Mm. And so I said, well, you know, what, what do you mean by the new heart? And he said, I'm not in the business of trying to fix an old heart. And he said, the mass majority of Christendom keeps saying, God, fix my heart, fix my heart. You know, I want to be right in my heart. I, I want you to just, I want you to do this in my heart. And you know, I'm mean and take this out of my heart. And God, you know, I, I don't love like I should and take this out of my heart. I'm not, I'm not kind like I should be. Take this out of my heart. And he said to me, he said, I want to take you to Jeremiah. The 17th chapter said that the heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it? And he said, and if that heart is desperately wicked and who can know it, that means that there is a depth to that heart that cannot be reached by the concept of man's comprehension. And he said, and if the depth of that heart have been birthed and shaped in iniquity mm -hmm. from the foundation of its father, right. the enemy that rules it, he said, just like there is no pit, there is no bottom to the pit of hell, then there is no bottom to what that heart is capable of doing and he said and therefore that heart does not have the ability to house an eternal word wow. because its destiny is eternal death wow. and so he said if the heart is desperately wicked who can know it and then he said to me I said well then God what are you saying he said I, I can't I can't place my word in that heart mm. and he said and what people keep doing is trying to take my word and apply it into that heart. It won't go in there. It, it, it goes around it because, because that word, that word is a powerful word. It's a purifying word. And he said, what I need to do, what I said I was going to do in the book of Ezekiel is I was going to take that heart out and put a new one in. And, put a new one in. <laughs> and so then I asked the Lord, I said, well, then if you want me to teach this, then you got to show me what it is that you're requiring me to do. How do I relate this this word and so he took me to Romans and, it, and, the, and, and the book of Romans said be not conformed to this world now watch this mark be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind when I went to the dictionary and I looked at the word transform it means to change from one form and statue and purpose to another but that wasn't the part that got me. When I read on down about six definitions, it got all the way down. It said, to cause to be converted, to convert. So that I took the pleasure of just going a little further and looking up the word convert. It said, to take an exchange for something that is equal in value. And then he said to me, what happens is, Lord, I thank you. What happens is, when I'm in the process of making a transformation in a person's life. He said, it is the job of the person. They keep saying to me, God, you do it. He said, but I told them in the book of Joel to rend your heart and, and not, not your, your garments. Heart. And so then that thing got me because I said, I said, well, then if I'm going to be converted, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to exchange a heart that its destiny is eternal death for a heart whose destiny is eternal life. So when he said to me that we must rend our hearts, Mark, that thing shook me because when I looked up the word rend, it said to tear it out violently, mm -hmm. to rip it out, to 
it is unrecognizable. Mm. That means we're to get before God and recognize what's in us that's so ugly and so evil until we can look at our own heart and say, God, I don't want this. I don't, I, I don't need this. I can't deal with this. Until we can get to that point. Because right now, we're living in a, in a day and time in this, in this Christian world where we don't like, we say, well, I don't like sin. But I'm talking about hating it. I'm talking about looking at yourself to the point where you say, God, I hate this about me. I hate this about me. I'm sick and tired of it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to go to you and pray about this anymore. I'm going to get on my face and I'm going to rip this thing out. I'm going to cry out to you and rip it out. Thank you, Jesus. He said, you got to understand the atmosphere. It's just like a doctor when you go into the hospital and you go in to get a heart transplant. Thank you, Lord. He just given this thing to me. He said, when you get a heart transplant, they have to take that body and lay it down and they have to hook it up to a temporary power to keep it alive while they take the old heart out and put the new heart in. And he said, and where we're stuck at, thank you, Lord, we have a dependency on the temporary power, which is the praise and worship service, which is, which is the church atmosphere. Is that, is that something? He said, but what I want to do is I want to get them to the point. He said, because there has to be an atmosphere. And what happens is in order for surgery to take place, it just can't happen just because you just repeat the sinner's prayer. It doesn't happen like that. He said, you have to be chosen. You have to be somebody I've chosen before the foundation of the world. It has to be a point where my power comes down and totally, whether it's in your bedroom, whether it's in your car, whether it's here at TBN, right here, somebody in the studio, he said the anointing is in this place right now. And what happens is the power of God, he shows up so that we don't die in the midst of transition. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. While we cry out, take it. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It. And while we're crying, God, take it. There's enough power in the atmosphere to keep that thing pumping, to keep us alive until the real transformation has taken place. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Oh, God. He said, there was, there was, there was three scriptures that he told me to read when I got on TV, and he said, I want you to read these three scriptures. And the first one is Ezekiel, the 12th, the 11th chapter, and the 19th verse. And I got to read it because you got to hear how he said this. And I will give them one heart, a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within them. And I will take the stony, unnaturally hardened heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. This got me. Sensitive and responsive to the touch of their God. Oh, that's why I don't understand people that says, I got a new heart, but praise and worship is going on. They sit in the church like ain't nothing going on. Mm, I'm going to give you a heart that's sensitive. That means if I say stop, you stop. That means if I say come, you come. That means if I say put your plate down, you put it down. That means if I say pray nine hours, you pray nine hours. Why? Because it's not my old heart trying to cooperate. We've taught the old heart how to behave like a Christian. Right. We've taught the old heart, oh, we go to church now, act right. Okay, don't go off on the usher because remember, okay, if I wasn't in church, I would go off on you. That's not the new heart. But the new heart is responsive. Awesome. Responsive to the touch of our God. And when you get the new heart, he says, that they may walk in my statutes, not try to walk, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my, or not try to keep, keep my ordinance and do them and they shall be my people and I shall be their God. In other words, the new heart has the will of the Father in it and there is no shadow of turning within. So the will of God is in the new heart, which means when that heart begins to pump and say, love me the more, you can't help but to love it. Mm. Because it's responsive to God. The second scripture he told me to read is 1 John 2 and 3. I just got to flip over here because somebody's watching this on TV and I want, them, I want them to get this. Two and three, it says, people always say, well, I got, what she mean I don't have a new heart? I know I got the new heart. Okay, well, let's find out. <laughs> he says, and this is how we may discern daily by experience that we are coming to know him to perceive and recognize and understand and become better acquainted with him if we keep 
bear in mind, observe, practice his teachings, his precepts, and, co and commandments. Whoever says, I know him, and I perceive, recognize, and understand, and am acquainted with him, but fails to keep and obey his commandments, his teachings, is a liar. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the gospel is not in him, but he who keeps treasures of his word, who bears in mind his precepts, who observes his message in its entirety. Mm. Truly in him, Mark, has the love of God and for God been perfected, completed, and reached maturity. By this we may perceive, by watching you and know and recognize and be sure that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought as a personal debt. In other words, I don't not sit anymore because, well, I don't want the people to find out in church and I don't want people to look at me funny and I don't want, and the pastor may be watching. And I, I'm scared because somebody may have saw me. No, no, no. I don't put down sin because I'm made to, but as a personal debt mm. to walk and conduct himself in the same way in which he walked and conducted himself. In other words, now that this, I, I have this new heart, I am no longer not doing things that pertain to the world and not being, not being conformed by the world system just because I quote unquote am a Christian. I'm doing it now because if I had a billion dollars, I couldn't pay God for what he's done. So I owe him. I put down cigarettes because I owe him. I stopped lying because I owe him. Oh my God. I look like a believer. I walk like a believer. I talk like a believer. I love like a believer because that's the debt that I owe him. And every day of my life, I want to pay that debt. Mm. But then he said to me, he said, but I want you to read this and help people to understand that, that, that this right here is the word of God talking. It says in the Amplified Bible, for people that say, well, I, well, I, well, I just don't get that. I just, and, 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 and I look around the church sometime when, you know, when I'm ministering and, and people are just kind of sitting there and, and you know, they kind of got their legs crossed looking like, you know, well, all right, that, that, that sounds all right. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really not, I'm really not moved by that. When God began to say to me, he said, look at people. He said, they don't even understand that the same gospel that you're preaching right now, if it don't lift your hands in this sanctuary, it won't lift you out the grave. It's going to be the same word. Wow. If the word doesn't doesn't quicken your mortal body now, wow. then how will you get up in the resurrection? Wow. Awesome. So he said here, he said here, but even if our gospel, the glad tidings, also be hidden, obscured, and covered up with the veil that hinders the knowledge of God, it is hidden only to those who are perishing and obscured only to those who are spiritually dying mm. and veiled only to those who are lost. That thing got me. Mm. He said, so when we, so we, when we up here and we're preaching the gospel, people look like, you know, I, I just don't get it. And you see people after 10 years of, of living for the Lord. Because he said, understand something. You need to understand that the world, the church world, need to begin to put a difference between baby saints and people that's been in church for 10 years. <laughs> People that's been in church for 20 years. When you have a baby, a baby is a year old, a baby is six months old. When that baby do the little poo-poo on itself, you say, come in and me take you to the bathroom and me clean you up. You're going to get that potty one day. It's all right. Don't be embarrassed. It's all right. Ten years, what, ten years old? Right. And the baby stands in the middle of the kitchen floor and he's ten years old now? And now he's did that little poo-poo? I don't know a mother in this country that'll say, oh, it's all right. You're going to get that pot one day. <laughs> Go ahead. And so why are we in this hour taking, taking for granted right. the grace of God? Right. Taking for granted willfully sinning. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yes. No, I'm not talking about, oops, I made a mistake. No, no, no. Because the book of James 1 said that when that thing happened, he said a man is led away and baited by, by his, his own, own, his own oh. lust. His right. own passion. Right. When that thing is conceived, that true. means whatever is presented to us must find a match with something that is already in Inside us. us. For the book of Mark said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles the man, but it's what cometh out of a man that defileth the man. 
And so at first, the enemy has to find a match. And now I know why Jesus said that the prince of this world cometh, but he find none of him in me. in me. In other words, he can't make me sin. He can't make me turn away from the Father because he doesn't find a match in me. There's nothing that he's presenting me that's already in me that's desiring that. And therefore, I'm able to reject him and rebuke him and stand and be unshaken by the power of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I think we got a witness in here tonight. Oh, yeah. Awesome. That's how you become unshaken. You become unshaken when you, when, you, when you get that new heart. When you say, God, I'll stop at nothing. He said, Paul said, daily, I die daily. That means God began to say to me, every single day of your life, I want you to get up before your feet hit the floor and say, God, I rip it out. Just in case it's something that I don't know. Just in case it's something that crept in in my sleep. I rend my old heart this morning. And I want the new heart because I plan to go in the first resurrection. I don't, you know, people are not talking about that. You know, we, everybody's, I, I, I was, I was listening to Paul a few minutes ago and he was, he was rejoicing over, you know, them giving them back the network and, and people sit and watch TBN and look so oblivious like, oh, what's going on? Oh, another satellite went up in Russia. Oh, that's nice. Oh, one went up in Japan. Isn't that cute? When they don't even understand the heartbeat of God. God is allowing all of those satellites to go up because his coming is soon. Coming. And I know right now, and you, you are totally aware of that, the Lord began to say to me, he said, you better preach balance. He said, you better preach balance. He said, you better warn, you know, our preachers and pastors to begin to preach balance because I know money is coming. I know that we're about to be blessed like we've never been blessed before. But he said, while you're getting a new house, you better get a new heart. Right. While you're getting a new car, you better get a new heart. That's right. That's it. He said, because what does it profit? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And any right pastor, the book, uh, I believe it's over in Matthew where it says, Woe unto you Pharisees. They clean the inside of the cup. Clean the outside of the cup. Clean the outside of the plate and the inside is dirty. So dirty. Woe unto you Pharisees who paint and glorify the tombs on the outside, right, right. but in the inside is dead bones. And he said, woe unto us for building beautiful sanctuaries and carpet and chandeliers and new choir robes when down in the heart of the people oh. is dead men bones. He said, it's time to preach a new heart. Go ahead. It's time for us to get a new heart. It's time to make us... It's time for us as preachers and pastors and teachers and prophets to provoke people. And God began to say to me, he said, when people leave your services and walk up to you in their ranks and say, I enjoyed your message, he said, that's not a compliment. Right. When a sinner walks up to you and say to you after one of your meetings, I enjoyed you, that's not a compliment. Right. He said, because I said to you that you ought to have the kind of power on your life through prayer and sacrifice that a sinner man can't sit in your service mm. without running to the altar saying, what must I do to be saved? And he said, woe unto us. And I, I was sitting here telling you that a few minutes ago, that every time I see you, you just, you just make my insides jump because we know, and I said this to you a few minutes ago, that anybody can give blood to a person that, that, that's dying, but the only person that can keep them alive is somebody with your blood type. Right. And so when you look at that whole, that whole facet of it, and God began to say to me, he said, you, you've got to begin to make sure that every opportunity that you get, every time you mount a platform, every time you mount a pulpit, every time you go on television, every time you go on radio, that you let my people know that I'm soon to come. That's the voice of the prophet. To run as the voice of God and, and, and checking the temperature of God and saying, this is what God is saying. I know what somebody else is telling you over here. And I know they're telling you get ease in Zion. But he said in the book of Ezekiel, woe unto the prophets that bring pillars into the house of God for the elbows of our people. Woe unto us that tell Zion it's all right and take a, take a chill pill. Woe unto us that are preaching to thousands and not preaching the plan of salvation. Woe unto us because it is no longer the world that's lost, the church is lost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Woe unto us yeah, yeah, yeah. that turn a deaf ear that turn a deaf ear and act as if we don't see sin because that's your favorite choir director and that's your favorite organist. And if I say that, I may lose. Woe unto us. Woe unto us. Woe unto us. Because what 
we're doing is we're giving permission for a low standard. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you don't see a lot of people in this hour. And you know the saints of old when we were when we were growing up in the church and and and, 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 and Lester Summerall, they, they didn't take that kind of garbage off of us. And then we I mean you look around the church now and everything goes and anything goes and whatever you want to do and whatever you want to say it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and while looking at that, then we have to ask ourselves, where is the power of God? You don't know how it excites me when I look on TV and watch you laying hands on people because people say, well, I want to be counseled. We got bigger churches, bigger sanctuary, and a whole list of counseling to be done right. because we don't have the power right, that we used to have. Right. When our preachers used to get up and preach when I was a child and the power of God would come, demons would cry out in the right. service. People would be knocked out of their seats under the power of under preach gospel. Whatever happened to that day? But I'll tell you what happened to that day. It's coming back again. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. It's about to be a takeover. It's about to be a takeover. Because whether we see it or not, and God begin to, he begin to let me know, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself with the fact that, yes, that, 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 that the body of Christ is more educated than it used to be. He said, don't fool yourself. He said, because in between those pews is a remnant that's crying out for the anointing. Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, y'all. Yes. Because the Bible said it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. I don't know about everybody else. I'm tired of going home the same. I'm tired of getting up and getting dressed and going to church and going through the motions. I'm tired of the choir and the praise and worship. See, I want something else. Yeah. There's got to be something else to this. There's got to be another level in God. There's got to be a greater power. Mm -mm. I had to, and I told my mother, I told my mother, I said, you've raised me in church all of my life. you raised me up in the church all of my life. And I get here and all I get is the choir and the praise and worship. Whatever happened to them, I want to see demons come out. I, I, I want to see devils scream. I want alcoholics to walk in services that are sloppy drunk and walk out sober. I want crack addicts to be delivered. Jesus. I want AIDS viruses to be yeah. healed. I want tumors to come out on the spot. And whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Lord, if you want somebody, you can send me. I don't mind sweating for the glory of God. I don't mind. I don't mind getting ugly because the song said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, God, I wish I could have some church in here tonight. And all that he's done for me. churches and soul tied. No, they did. No, you dried up. But my grandmother was here. My uncle was here. Away with that. I gotta get to where life is. I gotta go to where the anointing is. I gotta go where I can find victory in my walk. I'm tired of falling and stumbling. I want to walk worthy of the vocation. Oh, God, I thank you, Jesus. Mark, oh, God, I gotta hold myself down. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. God in this place. Go ahead. Got to have it. Got to have it. And the people of God, the people of God are crying out for it. And as a prophet of God, I can hear them. I can hear the cry of the Spirit. I can, I can actually hear the other day, the other morning when I was in prayer. I can hear, I can hear the souls of men crying out in a far distance. Don't leave me like this. of people that are stuck in bondage and trapped and all kind of messes. Don't leave me like this. Don't leave. And then I heard the Holy Ghost say, I'm coming. I'm coming. I heard it. I heard that. I heard that in my spirit. I heard that. I'm 
camera right there and just talk right into that camera and address address the nation i just i just want to tell you thank you lord the spirit of the lord the 
Spirit of the Lord is right there. He can't do nothing with your old heart. He said, but right now, right now, transformation is taking place. And if you want it, thank you, Lord Jesus. In the next few seconds, when I point my head at this camera, thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to lift your hands up. He cut out on a Because God said, after tonight, you will never be the same. watching. Or you can pick up the phone right now and call. Operators are right there. 
call and give your life to God. Now I know what he means when he said, give God your heart. That don't mean give him your old one and, and, and just let's, let's fix it. That means rip that old one out. Give it to him. So in exchange, he can give you a new one. One that is responsive to his touch. One that is responsive to his will. One that already comes with the will of the Father and righteousness built in it. Isn't that something? Yes. The new heart already got a way of God in it. Oh, he said, he said his ways are past finding out. Man's natural mind can't find it out. But when you get the new heart, the new heart already comes with the mind of God in it. It comes with the ways of God in it. And as you begin to feed that new heart the word of God, then that new heart will begin to mature. And as it mature, then it'll cause you to be ruled by your spirit and not by your flesh. Oh, somebody tell the Lord. Thank you. You know, there is, there is something categorically different about the move of God as opposed to the contrived movements of man. Yes. And we are experiencing at the moment a genuine visitation of the Holy Spirit. And that anointing translates beyond the lens of that camera. You know it, we know it. There's incredible power being released as the Word of God, carried by the wind and breath of the Spirit, is moving all over the world right now. Yes, it is. Get ready, world, and get used to it because God's going to take His Holy Ghost across the airwaves in ways we've not even begun to see yet. Yes, yes. There has got to come a deeper awareness of everything we're hearing in this season at this moment all across the breadth of the body of Christ if we are to see the renewal of His power on the earth. God Almighty swore to Moses when an entire generation said, We'd rather have the golden calf of Egypt because we can get our hands on it yes, yes, yes. than the misty glory of fire that scares us. Yes. God said, Moses, I'll kill them all. He said, no, don't do that. He said, if you kill them, kill me. This is about your reputation. But he said, this is what I need you to do. I need you to realize, Moses, that even if I go with you and take them up into the land, he said, as surely as I live, there's going to come a day when I'm going to cover the earth with my glory. Yes. And there are going to be a people that are not going to be afraid to press the envelope until they get into a place of total transformation and renewal where they let me be in them what I want to be in them. It's not enough. It's not enough for him to be the I am who is up in heaven. He wants to be the I am who yes. is in us. Yes, yes. In yes, all yes, his yes. unhindered glory, in no way compromise the fullness, every area of the vessel that has been prepared for the master's use has got to be surrendered and called out of every acquaintance that is going to keep it from the fullness of God and delivered from every restraint that will prevent it from becoming everything God called. I was, you know, I, I, there is, uh, Moses was crying when Pharaoh's daughter found him. Mm -hmm. And there is a cry in a generation that's been left in the bulrushes yes. for the devil to destroy. But some God-fearing remnant said there's got to be hope for a generation that's crying. That's right. And that crying generation has had to be raised between two conflicting things. One, there's the conflict of the imprint of the glory of God on their nature. But two, there's the conflict of the imprint of a church culture that has nothing to do with the kingdom at all. But it says when Moses came of age... When he grew up, the <laughs> conflict of the imprinted glory and the imparted culture started warring in his own soul because his heart wanted to know what destiny was about relative right. to glory. Right. And the first thing he did, and I want you to hear this because I really feel like this is part of the prophetic word. The first thing Moses did when there was a war inside between his heart for glory 
and the imprint of Egypt, when those two things collided, those, and it was more than just a feeling, the images of Egypt and the images of God's glory, the original pattern of destiny compared to the fabricated pattern of man, and Egypt is the land of the senses. It's the land of everything I can think, touch, taste, feel, and smell that I've contrived. Yes. But when those two places collide, the truly called of God make mistakes. And they're destined to make a mistake. I, the call of God comes when you make a mistake. When you think you can do in your own strength what can only happen in God's spirit. At that point, you will try to kill what God set up to fix you. And Moses tried to kill the Egyptian in his own power. And that led him away from everything that was familiar. And he spent 40 years taking a good look at what was in his heart. 40 years away from everything he thought he was supposed to do, having to look at, ooh, this is in me, that's wow. in me, the other thing's in me. But it's in the wilderness where he made new alliances. Some of you right now, those of you that are even watching, you've heard what was just said, and you know beyond any reasonable doubt you've made some mistakes lately. Join the club. That's the call of God. That's right. God is bringing you to an end of everything you could do in your own strength and in your own power. That's right. And in bringing you to an end of all that, you're going to make some new friendships. That's right. You, you're going to find out where your blood type really is. Yeah. <laughs> that is such the truth. <laughs> and where it is not. <laughs> and and when he gets when he gets he gets to a well. And there are seven daughters of one Ruel, who is the priest of a place called Strife. And Ruel, to me, what that means, what Jethro did was Jethro managed to live in a land where he was able to overcome the strife in his own heart and manage it well because of his confidence in Jehovah. <laughs> and he became Moses' mentor. And then God took Moses as far away from his calling to be a deliverer as he could. Wow. And when he got so far that he couldn't go any further, God said, now, come into union with me, and I'll send you back to set my people free. And, and everything, everything you're talking about is that journey. And what, what I, if it's okay, I, what, what we don't realize, you know, we are living in a day, woman of God, there are people today that are living who are seeing and feeling things that their ancestors, ancestors 100 years ago couldn't even cope with. Right. We're having to deal with pressures That's right. and things that a hundred years ago they never heard of. That's right. At the same time, God is saying, I'm at the deep, I'm causing convulsions. He said, don't look necessarily, there are signs, sure, there are signs of earthquakes and famines. He said, but it's only a natural manifestation of what's going on in the depths of the human heart. That's right. That's right. Every earthquake externally is merely a manifestation of the convulsion internally going on in the collective human soul right now. That's right. Because God's getting ready to bring the greatest revelation of His glory out of the yes, people we've ever seen. Yes, and, 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 and some of us, some of us are just beginning to find out who our real friends are. That's right. Because not everybody wants to hear about God doing radical surgery. No. And not everybody wants to hear about that for, for, for once and for all, not everybody wants to face the fact that they're not as wonderful as people have right. made them out to be. Right. That's a rude awakening. And you can't really truly embrace, you know, because I'm, I'm the guy that talks about love and acceptance and forgiveness, but you can't embrace that until you see yourself in all your nakedness. That's it. Until you can say, you know what? I ain't all I'm, I ain't all that. I, I, I ain't all that. And less, less the bag of chips. I ain't all that. And when we get there, when we get there, Something wonderful happens, and we come into a level of union with God. And we've got to close, but, and we're going to pray in just a moment. There, two weeks ago, I was in a meeting in Cleveland, and there was a woman who came forward with a debilitating disease. And I've been going through a very interesting journey myself. I know we've talked about where we've both been in the last few years, this place of seemingly alienation and isolation and, and sorting through a lot of things in our hearts yes, yes, yes. and God doing surgery. And, and there came a moment while I was praying for this woman who had a very severe illness crippling disease and it, there were some things going on in her and the Spirit of God led me to lay hands on her. When I did, I heard out of my spirit, this disease cannot stand in my presence and before I heard it, something in me said, wow, that's puffing up my ego. I got authority over this disease. So I said it, this disease cannot stand in my presence and the woman was totally healed. 
On Saturday, I was at TBN doing a workshop in California. And while I'm teaching, the Spirit of God said, don't you understand? It wasn't your, it wasn't my small M, it was my capital M that said that. Yes. Yes. It was not me who had authority over that disease. That's right. That healing came because at some point in the middle of that anointing, God was moving and I wasn't present to the fact that it had nothing to do with me. That's right. So I thought God was speaking through my own limited filter in that part of my heart that said, see, I've got authority. Well, I do have authority. That's it. But it's authority based on surrender. And it was such a pop, and it was like I had this epiphany on Saturday that said, my goodness, when you get to a place where, where you really are willing to surrender to God, when you say, my presence, it's capital M, not small M. That's it. It's Him doing the work that's through it. us. It's Him performing the miracles through us. And that's why when people say to me, oh, I really enjoyed you, I said, to God be the glory. And one lady said to me, oh, I know to God be the glory. But you know, I said, no. I will not steal the glory from God. Mm -hmm. If you say that's a cute dress, then I'll say thank you. If you say I like your hair, I say anything spiritual to God be the glory. Yeah. It's not Juanita Bynum. Right. And that's what I love about what you said. In this last hour, there will be no more one-man shows. Right. There will be no more stars. It will be the... Every time I, I, I sit down with you on a setting, something powerful happened because it's the corporate anointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just one person. It's what happened when more than one begin to touch and agree and have the same goal and the same yeah. mind toward the things of God. And so I'm not, in this, in this hour, there will be no more long ranges. I'm going to do it by myself. You're going to get so far, right. but you're going you're gonna to taper off right. because we need each other to make this last day move of God be what it's going to be. Uh, we need it all to come together. Uh, and I'd like to just, just take a moment to... Um, in, invite, and that, that's why I said to my staff, you know, we, 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 we've been fasting now, we've been consecrated, because I said to them, this, this, this conference that we're having, you know, Women Weapons of Power Conference, um, it's going to be August the 30th through September the 1st, and the, the, God gave us the theme on our consecration was come to the garden, and that's where Jesus went into the garden of Gethsemane, that's what, where he died to the will of the flesh, that's where he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done, and I said, I don't want to do a conference where people just come and just say, ooh, I've being. I want to do a conference where people can come and say, that's the place. I marked the X. That's where I died to the flesh. That's where I told God yes. That's where I gave him an eternal yes to his will. So, Mark, just pray for us because I, I just lifted my hands a few minutes ago and, you know, the enemy at the same time was saying, look at you just sweating and all hot. And that's why I lifted my hands and said, God, I told you anywhere, anytime, any place. I'm not ashamed of what you're doing in my life. That's the anointing that that you've given me. It's not a quiet anointing, it's a violent anointing. So anointing. when people invite me, they gotta know what they're inviting. Uh. <laughs> there's some, um, there's someone watching, you have the beginnings of Parkinson's disease. Yes. Uh, in the last four months, the, uh, the stage has been set for this disease to begin to take control of your body. You're not old, you're about 52 years old, and while the power of God was moving on the woman of God, uh, the glory of God began to move into your living room, and you need to know that the touch you felt in your body and the trembling that was going on was the beginnings of a healing. God is totally delivering you from the effects of Parkinson's. This will not be able to stay in your mortal body. Will not be able to stay in your mortal body. There was someone else that while she was preaching, you have suffered from a level of macular degeneration and you are totally healed right now by the power of God. Jesus himself healing you. There is someone else you've been watching and you have an area on a side of your abdomen where there are actual lumps. They're like uh, t lumpy tissues and uh, where there's uh, a reddish sort of a, a bloody rash. And if you'll check right now, if you'll go into the restroom and check right now, you'll discover the rash 
and the lumps are disappearing. This was the result of a curse that was put on your life years ago that you never quite knew why you emotionally were so crippled. And God tonight, when she said God's giving you a new heart, he was dealing with the root in you that was fearful. And when that happened, your body began to respond biologically to the revelation coming into your spirit. God's totally healing you. Go check right now. Get in front of a mirror and look. That rash and those lumps are totally disappearing at this very moment. Jesus is healing you now, right now. There's someone else you have been watching, and there has been... Uh, some sort of a problem with the retina, uh, retinitis, retinitis. God is healing this at this very moment by the power of his Holy Spirit. There's someone else being healed at this moment of peripheral blindness. You can only see so far. And as you continue to worship him and glorify him, full peripheral vision is coming back. While the doctors say it's impossible, the Holy Spirit says with God, nothing is impossible. You are receiving deliverance right now in Jesus' name. There's a young man watching. You are about 17 years old. You were raised in church. Mama and Daddy haven't got a clue. You've been messing with cocaine. You've been strung out, and you are crying out to God right now because you've hit rock bottom, and you're thinking about taking your life. Son, when you were a young boy, you gave your heart to Jesus. Tonight, God is calling you back to his heart, and God's setting you free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I want you to begin to cry out to God that demon of addiction is coming out of you now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command it to loose its hold on you. It can't hold you anymore. The root of the reason this demon came in was because of a root of rejection in your life that goes back to a situation of sexual abuse when you were about four years old from a man in the neighborhood and I break the curse off of you now in Jesus name you are being set free by the power of God God's totally gonna deliver you son God knows exactly why you got hooked on the addiction because you didn't know how to translate the religious world of Christianity into the power of God to heal the, the rejection in your soul but tonight Jesus himself is delivering you from the root of that rejection and the fruit of the addiction you're being set free now in the name of Jesus somebody give God a praise in here as as we get ready to close, we're going to just join in prayer. I want everyone in the, car, in, the, in the audience to join with me, and we're just going to agree in prayer. We've got about a minute and a half left, and I want to just say, if you've enjoyed tonight, every night of the week, 24 hours a day, as a matter of fact, seven days of the week, there's something incredible going on right here on your TVN station. Paul and Jan have made a lavish banquet table on behalf of the Holy Spirit for you and I to enjoy. And that's so that you can experience the power of God nonstop. That phone number on your screen is going gonna, is gonna to be there. The prayer partners will be there long after this broadcast goes off. But in the meantime, I want Prophet Bynum to pray for us as we close tonight, as we believe God for your healing, your deliverance, and your transformation. God, we thank you right now for what you've done in this place. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done around the world. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in the lives of every individual, God, that tuned in today. And so, Father, we pray the blessing of the Lord over this network and over these people that are in this audience and over those that are watching and even over Prophet Sharona. We thank you, Lord, for the victory. And we call all things done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless you. Tomorrow night, live from Dallas, Marilyn Hickey, Tommy Tinney, Dr. Carl Ball, Dr. Gerald Mann, Nathan Gina Schaub, and Vicki Yoey. Don't miss one moment of praise. This is your TBN network. Remember your love gifts. They help keep TBN going around the world 24 hours a day. We love you. God bless you. Keep on praising.
of intervening and getting in the middle of your business without asking you. Now that means what you heard about me was probably true, sister, but God. That means I haven't always been right, but God. That means I've been around the corner a few times. I thought I was still going to be going around the corner, but God. I didn't know I was going to preach, but God. I didn't know I was going to teach, but God. I didn't know I would be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Doboshakatabasi and speaking to the Doboshah and speaking to the Basah, but God. I didn't know I could live without cigarettes. I didn't know I could live without liquor. I didn't know I could leave the streets. I didn't know I can live without crack. But, but, but God. And so you see, my sisters and my brothers, we're dealing with a realization tonight that we cannot explain to our peers what exactly it is that motivates us to do what we do. We break up with people we can see to serve a God we cannot see. We make decisions and leave a better job, a lesser job, a better job for a lesser job so that we can just have time to worship God on Sundays in here. We step outside of things that we used to love and all of a sudden we don't love them anymore because the Bible says if any man, and that's generic for woman to be in Christ, he is, she is, a new creature, old things have passed away way and behold that means look y'all all things have become new and then you 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 hate things you used to love and you don't know what happened between Tuesday and Friday but God oh help me Holy Ghost help me Holy Ghost the one that I heard somebody write the song which ought to be the theme song of every child of God in here tonight amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and I want you to understand tonight my sisters and my brothers don't you ever try to downplay the role of grace in your life amen it wasn't just ordinary grace that brought you in here tonight amen some of y'all know I'm telling the truth some of you know how way off in sin you used to be it takes more than just plain grace to take a dope addict off the needle it takes more than just plain grace to bring you off the dance floor it took more than plain grace to get you out of the gang it's amazing grace it takes amazing grace to put you in the place that you ought to be clap your hands and throw them up and say hallelujah and so and so and so we need to understand what grace is all about we need to understand what the Lord has done for us. And we can see evidence in, evidences of it in how he blessed young Abram. And I love the fact that when God spoke to young Abram and said, leave the land of your nativity, Abram immediately rose up and stepped out in faith. Church, first of all, I want to tell you tonight, God will never tell you to give, give up something unless he has something better for you. I know I'm preaching to somebody. I said, God will never tell you to give up something unless he has something better better for you come on and say praise the Lord somebody beloved if God said put it down God told me to tell you there's always something better for you to pick up it may not be apparent right then Abraham couldn't see what God was trying to take him Abraham didn't know the layout of the land to which God had called him but the Bible says he stepped out in faith and I stopped by to tell somebody here at the New West Angeles Cathedral if you're going to get anything from God then you're gonna to have to learn to move in faith because I heard the prophet of old say the just shall live by his faith and we walk by faith and not by sight and God told me to tell you if you can't see it then don't worry about it tell your neighbor if you can't see it don't worry about it if you can't understand it don't worry about it if you can't figure it out don't worry about it all you need to do is just ask one question and that is did God say it did God say it and if God said it I'm going I don't care how silly I look I don't care how folk laugh at me I don't care how I'm ridiculed all I want to know is did God say it is God in it and if God is in it some way somehow he's going to bless you and make everything all right after a while if you believe in somebody scream oh so Abraham stepped out the Bible says in faith 
and then God blessed him. You all know the Bible story changed his name from Abram to Abraham and changed his wife's name and took her from Sarah to Sarah and then blessed them with a son in the midst of their old age. Church, I'm just trying to give you a little history for a moment. And church, then God gave them young Isaac and then Isaac had Jacob and Jacob came forth with the 12 sons of Israel. Oh, I feel God up in here tonight. Look at how God was working. We can see God even dealing back in the time of the patriots. Now there was one son of Jacob huh, that stood out from the rest of his boys. Huh, and the Bible says his name was Joseph. Huh. Am I telling the truth tonight? Huh? Well, Pastor Ron, what was so different about Joseph? Huh? Well, what was so strange about Joseph? Huh? Well, Joseph, thank God, like Bishop Blake, was a dreamer. Huh? Look at somebody, tell them, wake up and dream. Huh? I know it sounds like a dichotomy. Huh? I know it sounds paradoxical. But look at your neighbor and tell them, wake up and dream. Huh? Joseph was a son. He was a dreamer. Huh? He had visions. Huh? And if you're going to go anywhere with God, you got to get a dream. Huh? you got to capture a vision. Huh? You need some passion about your life. Huh? Ask God to give you a dream. Huh? I know you've been going through some melancholy, mundane situations. Huh? But God is a God of dynamics. Huh? He's a God of moving. Huh? He's a God of revelation. Huh? So get yourself a dream. Huh? And the Bible says young Joseph had a vision huh? that one day he was going to become more than he already was. Huh? That's what I love about God when he saves you. He doesn't want you to drive just stake in the ground just because you get saved. Huh? Even when he fills you with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Huh? Don't drive your stake in the ground. Huh? Seek for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Huh? And when he gives you the gifts of the Spirit like the young man went forth in prophecy. Huh? Don't drive your stake in the ground. Huh? Ask God for the gift of the word of wisdom. Huh? So he can give you insight and foresight into the future. Huh? Then ask for the gift of the word of knowledge. Huh? So you can understand what to do with the wisdom. Huh? Then ask for the gift of the discerning of spirits. Huh? So you can know what type of folk you're dealing with. Huh? Because everybody's smiling in your face. Huh? I'm telling you what I experience now. Huh? It's not necessarily your friend. Huh? Sometimes they're just friendly enemies. Huh? The dis undisputed truth back in the 70s huh? said a smiling faces tell lies. Huh? Smiling faces show no traces huh? of the evil that lurks within. Huh? A smile is just a frown huh? turned upside down. Huh? And Jesus picked it up and said everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Everybody that says Lord, Lord shall not enter in. Huh? And God gave Joseph a dream. Mm, do we have any dream merchants in the house? Uh, and so he gave him a dream. Uh, and Joseph was a, he, God gave him dreams uh, because he wasn't only religious. Uh, he didn't just come to church in his Versace and his Mari alligators. Uh, but sometimes he'd come in his polo shirt uh, and just come in a raggedy jean shirt. Uh, he didn't just have religion. Joseph had a relationship. Uh, oh Lord, I feel cold spirits up in here. Uh, and because of his relationship with God, uh, he he didn't just have a gift. Huh? He couldn't just do those curly curly to make people shout. Huh? You got a lot of folks talking about heaven and singing about heaven and ain't going there. Huh? A lot of folks, they just use that gift to, to get people to, to praise them. Huh? They like to you to see the ability of the gift that they have, so they want praises from you. That's what you call the Lucifer syndrome. But every gift that we have according to the Spirit of God and the Word of God is given to the body of Christ to edify the body and then so the person can be edified himself to build up the work of God here on the earth and so when you have a relationship God would deal with you in dreams and visions and he gave Joseph a dream that one day he was going to be more than he was and the Bible tells us that he gave Joseph a, a dream and, and he gave him a vision and showed his other brothers bowing down and paying obeisance unto him and the Bible tells me my sisters and my brothers uh, and maybe this will help somebody in here tonight uh, that Joseph made one mistake uh, he took his dream and shared it with his brothers. Oh, I stopped by to tell somebody that sometimes you cannot tell folk everything that God has revealed to you. Come on and say amen if you believe it. You can't reveal every secret that God gives to you because some things that God reveals to you are just for you and you can't tell nobody because when you tell folk, they'll get upset with you because God is dealing with you. 
They were your friends all alone. But when you're talking about God blessing you and what God showed you in a dream, they get mad because God's blessings are on your life. And if you don't watch them, they'll try to turn your dream into a nightmare. They'll try to kill your dream. Oh, don't sit up there and look at me with that West Angeles look. Look at me and say amen. Come on and say amen. So the Bible tells us that he revealed his dream to his brothers. He didn't reveal it to a Muslim. He didn't reveal it to a, a science of the mind. He revealed his dream to his brothers. What kind of day is this when you can't even tell what God is doing in your life and share the blessings of the Lord with your brothers? And when he shared his dream with his brothers, the Bible, not Ron Gibson, the Bible says his brothers copped an attitude. Oh, y'all remember the story. Stop looking at me like I'm reading out of the Holy Quran. This is out of the Holy Bible. I know you want some pie in the sky before you die, but this is some sound on the ground while you're still around. Listen to what God is saying up in here, up in here tonight. Y'all know the story. They persuaded Jacob to let them take Joseph off on a little trip after he shared his dream, if you please. And while they had young Joseph in the wilderness, the Bible says they took him and threw him in a ditch. And somebody said, let's go ahead and kill him. But I can hear the oldest brother Reuben speak up and say, no, we can't kill him because he is our brother. Now that's a whole sermon all by itself. And maybe Bishop will let me come back another Sunday morning and preach, no, we can't kill him. He's our brother. But I stopped by to tell somebody, we got too, 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 too many brothers and sisters killing one another right up in the church. Come on and say amen. So the Bible says they let him down in a ditch and said, now finally we're going to get rid of this dreamer. We're going to sell him away as a slave down in Egypt land. Y'all know the story. They said they were going to get through with Joseph. Now finally we're through with this dreamer. But I stopped by to tell somebody on my way to heaven, when God has something for you, listen child of God. This is a prophetic word that I want to sink down into the inner sanctums of the subterranean chambers of your soul. When God has something for you, can't nobody and no devil in hell take it away from you. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the purpose of the Lord, all things work together for good to them that good things and bad things and all things work together for good to them. Look at somebody tell me I love the Lord because if you love the Lord, God has a way of recycling that evil and make it turn out for your good because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. If you believe it, clap your hands and shout glory. Shout glory. Oh, don't worry about them. They might try to put some traps and roadblocks in your way. They may try to set some ditches in your pathway. They may try to tangle up your feet and try to impede your progress in God. But I stop by to tell you, my sisters and my brothers, and let this be a confirmation to what God has already told you. If God said something is yours, then it's going to be yours. Just hang on in there, baby. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. And after a while, somebody help me say, after a while, the Lord will make a way somehow. After a while, God will open a door that no man can shut. After a while, God's going to put you on high. Say yeah. I can see Joseph. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I can see Joseph down in Egypt. Now he's down in a dungeon, up and down like a roller coaster. And that's how it gets some time for the people of God. He got elevated to the chief porter in the house of Potiphar, huh? only to get messed up and lied on again. Huh? But you see, God let him down, huh? only to give him something better. Huh? Y'all don't hear me up in here. Huh? Joseph, he said, I don't want you to run a household. Huh? I got a whole country for you to run. Huh? Say yes, somebody. Huh? Some of y'all fretting about what you lost on yesterday. Huh? But I stopped by to tell you, look at what's coming tomorrow. Huh? Lord, have mercy on me today. Huh? Y'all know the story how God elevated him through his dreams. Huh? and made him prime minister of the land of Egypt. And way by and by, look at God working behind the scenes. Because way by and by, the Bible says famine arose in Canaan. And those same brothers, yes, those same conniving, scandalous brothers that set a trap for young Joseph, those same brothers that trapped the snare for Joseph had to come and eat bread before his table. How many of y'all 
I know he prepares a table before you huh? in the presence of your enemy. Huh? Well, what are you saying, Pastor Ron? Huh? Well, Brother Mike, I guess it's time to strike up the organ. Huh? I feel a little preachy in here. Huh? I feel the presence of God. Huh? I feel the kind of glory huh? hovering all over this place. Huh? Well, what are you saying, Pastor Ron? Huh? As I told you, as I told you before, huh? do y'all mind if I take my coat off? Huh? I don't want to mess up my tailor-made suit. Huh? They cost a whole lot of money to make. Huh? And you know when you sweat your suit, they get real. They tear on you. Huh? I'm not trying to be muscle-bound huh? because I ain't all that. Huh? But I'm just enough for Sister LeVette. Huh? And I'm so glad I'm married tonight huh? so I can preach huh? the hell out of you. Huh? Send your word tonight. Huh? All things work together for good. Huh? I don't care what you're going through. Huh? I don't care what you're in right now. Huh? God said everything you're going through huh? is going to work out for my purpose. Huh? Don't worry about it huh? because folk are trying to run you down. Huh? Don't worry about it huh? because they're trying to kill your dream. Huh? Don't worry about it huh? because it seems like they're stepping on you. Huh? I'm going to tell somebody huh? on my way to heaven. Huh? When you get in trouble, huh? don't take any tranquilizers. Huh? Don't go back on crack. Huh? Just crack open your Bible. Huh? Let your fingers do the walking huh? and let the Holy Ghost do the talking. Huh? And if you seek the Lord huh? and ask him for a rhema word. You just, just, just might run across the psalm where David said the Lord is my light whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, they came upon me to eat of my flesh. They stumbled and fell because the steps of a good man, I feel like preaching in hell. The, 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 the steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord. A thousand may fall by your side. Ten thousand by your right side. But God told me to tell you, none of them, not one of them shall come nigh thee. Yea, though I walk through the valley, I'm not going there to stay. I'm going through, but I'm coming out because he knows the way that I take. And after he's tried me, I'm coming out with a new shout. I'm coming out with a new anointing. I'm coming out with a new song. My soul look back and wonder how I got over. Tell somebody the Lord is with you. Stop worrying about it. Stop fretting about it. Because God, he didn't give you a spirit of fear but a power and of love and a sound mind. I'll keep you in perfect peace. If you keep your mind not on your boyfriend. Keep your mind not on Cleo and the 1-900 number but keep your mind stayed on me. See yeah. And if you do that he said my rod and my staff they comfort you. You prepare a table right before me in the presence of my enemy. And this is the part that I like. You anoint the anointing, the burden bearing, yoke destroying, power of God. When you are anointed, stop some money, tell them I am anointed by God. Tell somebody else, I am anointed by God. When, when, when you are anointed, no weapon, no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. In every wagon tongue that rises up against you, you can condemn it. This is the heritage of the child of God. He anoints my head, your head with oil. My cup, if you believe on me, as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow, shall flow rivers of living water. Your spirit filled to be spirit spilled. I said your spirit filled to be spirit spilled. I come that you might have life. Give life away. He gave you the keys to death, hell, and the grave. You got power on the inside and it will work on the outside. It's God that 
works in you the will and the to do of his good pleasure. Say yeah! I got to close. Mm-hmm. In nine more days, I'll be 46. I'm not as strong as I used to be. May not be able to close this sermon, but if I don't say another word, I preached already. Look at somebody. Tell them that Negro preached. I got a word from the Lord. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Come on and let the Lord hear you say, yeah. I'm getting ready to close. But I wanted you to see where we were coming from. You know the story. They stayed in Egypt and came out after 400 and something years. They went back into the land of Canaan. Moses took them most of the way. And then young Joshua or young Bishop Blake helped them cross the Jordan river but now we see them in the new west angeles i mean now we see them in the promised land god said i'll bless you if you obey me lord help me but wickedness came over israel ungodliness got a stronghold and now we read in judges 19 way down among the levites there was a man who had a wife and the bible says she played a whore and ran away she went down to her father's house and this man got his servants together and went down there to retrieve his wife but way over at the end of one day's journey they came to a city according to the text in the land of Benjamin by the name of Gideon Gideon Lord have mercy on me the hotels were undoubtedly full and there wasn't any place for this man to rest so the Bible says they settled in the streets and a man in the city walked by their way and said come on into my house because it's dangerous in Gibeah we got sissies in Gibeah strange women in Gibeah y'all ain't saying nothing so come on into my house God showed me Bishop Blake build this place like an ark and he's telling you come on into this house. I just gotta keep moving. I can't tell who's with me or against me but I gotta keep moving. Sometimes I don't have anybody to laugh with or talk to but I gotta keep moving. I can't see my way clear but I know I can't stay where I was. I gotta help my foot to find the pot. I know it's out here somewhere and if I press my way my God, I feel something in this place. And so, I didn't want him to see me, because you know how I am. I like to have myself together. But it was in the dark, he couldn't see me no way. And there was no dignified way to grope. So while the lights was out, and they couldn't see what I looked like, I was all out like this. I'd have done it real dignified if I could, I'd have done it like that. But see, it was an emergency mode. And when it's an emergency mode, you don't have time to worry about dignity. You gotta go ahead and get in whatever position you got to get in to get the breakthrough you gotta get. You just got to do what you got to do. I come to tell somebody you just got to do whatever you got to do put that pretty stuff in the closet and go ahead and get to the next place because something is about and so uh, please sit, sit down I'm not I'm not trying to excite you I just I would just want to tell you something. Now the thing, the thing that's important about it, the place, is that there is a time 
and a season for every purpose under heaven. There is a correlation then between the time, the season, and the, and the place. It's not just getting to the place, but it's getting to the place at the right time. See, the miracle of the story is this. She hopped up on the right place. And she got to the place at the same time that Boaz, the owner, happened to have left the city of Bethlehem and he happened to be coming out to visit the field. And he happened to be looking in her direction of the field when she happened to stumble up in the place. Had she happened up on that place any other time, she would have lost her miracle. But because she was in the right place at the right time, time and purpose slapped their hands together. I don't know if you can catch what I'm trying to preach. And so, I, I laugh at people, they often ask me, uh, what one event led to the shift in your ministry? It's kind of hard to answer that, ma'am, because it's never any one event. It's a series of events that when you look back on it, if this hadn't happened, that wouldn't happen, if that wouldn't happen, this wouldn't happen, if that wouldn't happen, this wouldn't happen. But in the middle of all of those series of events, there's always one primary thing that is a destiny point. And my destiny point ministerially was this. Sit down, sit down, sit down, relax. Y'all are so excited. I was preaching everywhere, preaching for everybody. The Lord was blessing. Full-time ministry, going forward. I'd already done Woman Art Loose. Nobody knew it, nobody heard of it, nothing like that. Already writing, nobody knew it, nobody heard of it, nothing like that. Preaching in major facilities, but not on a major, major scale, major for me. I happened to get an invitation to go to speak for Higher Dimensions in Tulsa. There were three speakers to speak at a pastor's conference. It wasn't Azusa, it wasn't a big one, it was Azusa pastor's conference held at Carlton Pearson's church. Three speakers were to speak. One Wednesday, one Thursday, one Friday. I was to speak Thursday. Brian Keith Williams spoke Wednesday and Dr. Hamby spoke Friday. We spoke, I spoke a message behind closed doors. Pastor Pearson was on television, I wasn't. He decided to play a clip of each one of the three speakers. He, it was a seven minute clip. Seven minutes, three times seven is 21. By the time he did his opening, his close, and his advertisement, it took up the 30 minute window. Seven minutes. He played seven minutes of my sermon. Whoever was in the editing booth had to choose which section of my sermon to play. He, in the editing booth, chose a particular section of the sermon where I was talking about Christ showing his wounds. So that was the clip he chose. He chose that clip, it was edited into the show. Carlton aired that show. He decided, Carlton decided when to air that show. Had he decided to air it at another time, even though he used that particular clip, it wouldn't have made any difference. Paul Crouch happened to come home at the time that Carlton Pearson's show was on. He happened to reach for the remote control at the particular seven minute window that my particular clip of a sermon happened to be on. If he would have went in the kitchen to eat a ham sandwich, it just so happened that, that Paul Crouch was writing a book called I Had No Father But God. And he was struggling with whether he should tell the details of the story of his life. And so when I start talking about showing people your wounds, it just so happened that that was what he needed to hear at that particular moment in his life. 
if the person in the editing booth had chose another section of my message, even though it was me preaching, it wouldn't have gotten done what it needed to get done. But because I happened to say yes to a conference that Carlton happened to have, and Carlton happened to put it on television, and it happened to be the right seven minutes that the right person heard it at the right time, when Paul heard it, he started crying, called Carlton on the phone, said, find who this big joker is from West Virginia, and bring him to California. Is there anybody in here who can understand what I'm talking about? All of a sudden, I ended up in a situation that nobody understood. I was on the phone talking to one of my friends said, you'll never be on television. You don't have no way to be on television. You don't know anything about television. You don't own no cameras. You don't have no staff. You don't have no crew. You don't have no people. You don't have no backup. You didn't come from a major church. You don't preach the right style. You holler too much. You sweat too much. You make too much noise. You will have to change everything before you can get in. But don't let nobody mess you up when you're getting close to your spot. If you know that you got something down inside of you, don't let no devil in hell turn you around. God! Slap somebody and say something is about to happen. After all the hell I've been through and after all the pain I've bought and all the suffering I've been through, I can feel my foot about to hit the place where something is about to happen. to but I feel like I'm talking to somebody and whoever you are you might think that you just happened to come to the potter's house today but no this was a setup you're in the right place at the right time hearing the right message for what you're going through at this moment God wants you to know your foot is almost in the spot and you're gonna stumble up into something that I haven't seen yes. And so, Boaz looked out across the field and he said to his staff, he said, who is that woman? Who is that, that damsel over in the corner? She was over in the corner of the field. And he says to Ruth, come on out of that corner. My, my word to you is come on out of that corner. Partners. I'm beckoning for you because it's time for you to come out of that corner. This is your hour. This is the moment of your destiny. Do you hear me? For the people who are the least likely, we're going to do the almighty. Not because everybody was on our side, but because God was on our side. And if God is for you, he's more than the world against you. Snatch somebody and say, come out of that corner. 
You know, when God brings you out of the corner, he'll bring you from the background to the forefront. People don't even know who you are or where you came from, but all your life, God's been preparing you. He's been getting you ready. He's been demonstrating his word in your life. Everything you ever went through in your life is getting you ready for one shining moment. When it is your moment, don't let nobody steal your moment. Don't let nobody have your moment. Let them have your car. Let them have your keys. Give them your hat. Give them your coat. But don't give anybody your moment. This is your moment. And, and so Boaz says, bring her out of that corner. And he spoke to his staff and he said, there's going to be a woman coming out of the corner and she's going to be behind you in the shadows, gleaning. All of her life she's been gleaning whatever she could, but I'm getting ready to make things easier for her. Said she's coming. Touch somebody and say, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. I may not be there, but I'm, but I'm coming. <sighs> I haven't arrived, but, 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 but. And he said, if, if you see a comer coming, if you see a comer coming, then leave handfuls on purpose. Don't leave it for anybody. But if you see a comer coming, Tell somebody and say, I'm coming. He said, I want you to leave. So what they did, let me show you what they did in case, in case you don't have no video screen in your head. The gleaners didn't take everything off out of the field. They started just dropping handfuls of wheat on purpose so that when Ruth started coming behind them, she started getting these unnatural blessings. Things that didn't even make sense had been left laying on the ground for her. Whoever I'm talking to, all of a sudden you're starting to get stuff that doesn't even make sense. And you say, I don't even know where this blessing is coming from. I don't even see how, how could this be left laying here? You, you weren't even supposed to get it, but God is leaving you a breadcrumb trail. He's just dropping stuff. And all you got to do is keep coming. Touch somebody and say, just keep coming. Now, I want you to see this. I believe that the reapers in the Old Testament symbolize the angels in the New Testament. For in the New Testament, the Bible, when it says the master spoke to the angels and said, bind them in bundles that they might be gathered, he's talking about reaping the harvest of the earth. I believe, this is me, I believe. I believe that the angels who are the staff of God have been commanded to leave handfuls on purpose for comers so that when you're on your way you hit this place after struggling to catch whatever you could you hit this place where it starts just being dropped to you. That's why when we worship, we throw our hands up. Because we believe that when praises go up, blessings just come down. And I believe that God has a way from heaven of just dropping you stuff. If you're open to receive it, hear me good. He'll hand you a business.
and just drop it to you. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. She must have received one. For all of you who don't understand these demonstrative, assertive, aggressive, hysterical people who keep breaking out into spanktoraniums and having fits of praise and worship, it's something about being in a place and you don't even know what you're doing and you stumble up on a blessing and you don't even know how you got it and then you come to church and the preacher is preaching about the very thing that you're going through at that moment in your life it's not that you want to be wild or act crazy or become unglued but because you've been going through something and you didn't have nobody to talk to about it and you just came to church and you didn't know that God was going to read your mail in the Sunday morning message. It's hard to act cool when you're finally getting some word from God and you want to touch people and say, that's me. He's talking about me. I'm going through that right now. God just did that for me. He opened the door for me. He made a way. My mother was a, she was a teacher by profession and she was a graduate of Tuskegee and she taught school part of her life. She was also state representative for equal employment opportunities years ago back in West Virginia, did a whole lot of things. And she bought several parcels of property years ago back up in the 60s and ended up renting those properties and owned them almost up to when she died, received rent off of real estate and made herself income that made her senior years more comfortable. And she told me one day, we were sitting around talking, she said, look at all of this land I own. She owned one, two, three, four, five houses and an apartment building that had three small apartments. And she said, look at all of this land I own. They weren't fancy houses, just ordinary houses. But she said, uh, look at all this land I own. And, and her, her next statement is what got me, she said, and I was just playing. She said, I was, I was just playing. She said, I was just, something would come on sale and I just, I just was just playing. I didn't know that I was just playing my way into something that was gonna anchor the rest of my life. And so I learned something from mama. Just keep playing. <laughs> If, if you don't sweat the small stuff <laughs> and you don't take life too seriously and you don't worry about things and just keep playing, if you keep a merry spirit, see a lot of people get so busy and important they stop being happy. But, but if you just keep a merry spirit and just keep... Now you're gonna, re you're gonna notice a few things about me. Number one, I don't want you to hurt yourself. Just relax because I am very comfortable with the fact, so you might just well get comfortable too. I am not your ordinary preacher. <laughs> Thank God for that. Ordinary preachers, Start off slow and stately. 
and then wind up to a crescendo at the end. We start out at the crescendo and go from there. So you're gonna have to listen loud, fast, and furious. Are you ready? Because we're gonna hit the ground running tonight. The second thing you're gonna notice is that I am an audience participation preacher. Just go ahead and just nudge your neighbor on the shoulder a little bit, just nudge them. See if they're alive. Nudge them a little bit. See, you can't be sitting there and making out your grocery list while I'm giving this word to you because it costs me too much to get it and you get it free, but you're at least going to participate in it. Are you with me? Here's what I want you to do. I want everybody to stick that little finger of yours out just like that. Come on, everybody. Right hand, darling. Re thank you. Help those don't know their right from their left. You ready? Here we go. We're going to follow the bouncing preacher. We're going down. Oh, you're good. Get out there. We're going to the right. No, honey, you're right. You ready? Okay, let's start over up here. Ready? Here we go. Up, right, up, left. Look at you. You anointed. Down, right, up, left. Do it again. You did pretty good. One more time, come on. Somebody said, why in the world would he have us do this? Because there is prophetic significance to everything I do. This is inspiration, not entertainment. Are you ready? Down, right, up. Left. Folks say, why would he make us do that? Because that's exactly where you've been living, isn't it? Only yours is about like this. And it's closing in on you all the time, isn't it? Because that's where you've been living, isn't it? Right inside that little box. Right inside that little religious box where that's the only way God operates and he couldn't possibly do anything else because that's the way God has always done it. Right inside that little religious box where they told you you were a woman and you could never carry the gospel anyway. You've been living right there in that little poverty box where you drive and something held together with Christian. Don't be looking at me like that. I saw what you drove in here. Come on. Look, that's where you've been living in it right there. All you've got is what the boss man give you. You just went from one slave trader to another. You just working day by day by day and just getting your little, you owe your soul to the company store living right inside that little box of debt because they told you you couldn't ever get your house paid for. You were never going to have a new car. You Second, they put you in that little black box, didn't they? They said, yeah, they put you in the white box. They put you in the born on the wrong side, the tracks box. They, they put Put you right inside that little box and they told you to stay right there but I came up in here in Dominion camp meeting because I'm looking to find me somebody that just come on you got to shake that thing a little bit because it's not going to let you out easy come on I need somebody help me help me come on come on come on come on come you oh, oh. somebody ready to get out your box are you ready are you ready touch your neighbor and tell him I'm coming out I'm coming out I like it but I ain't hanging out with you in here no more I don't like it some of us know there's more than what we've had some of us have a dissatisfaction with our satisfaction come on come on get your Come on, come on, do this right here. Hup! Now look out there. Look down at your feet. That's where you are. Now look up past your fingertips. That's where you're headed. Some of you are going to have.
have to look in your rearview mirror on the way home and be startled and say, who in the world is that staring back at me? I, I went up to Dominion camp meeting and it did for me what a phone booth did for Clark Kent. I've been changed by the power of God. Tell somebody and tell them, excuse me, but it's changing me. There, there's a change coming. You can be seated, grab your Bible, turn it to page 241. Page 241 in the Old Testament. Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, began a discourse with his disciples. Your Bible records words along these lines. When Jesus came onto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered him and said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, or Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets raised again from the dead. But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answering saith unto him, Thou art the Christ, uh, the anointed one that destroys every yoke. He'd said a mouthful, hadn't he? Thou art the Christ, the anointed one that destroys every yoke, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answering saith unto him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you. Now, let me just parenthetically insert a few things right here because I want you to understand tonight that Jesus is going to take you on a little journey. You're not about to leave here like you came. God is just about to do a transformation not only in your spirit but in your mind and your body as well. You are about to have a divine encounter with absolute truth. Are you in the building with me? You see, I, I didn't stutter when I said that. I didn't, I didn't take a step backward and take your pulse to see whether or not I ought to say that. I just came out here because I've been out there with him and when I was out there with him he put a word down in my belly and he didn't ask me what I thought you'd think about it he just told me to come in here and say what he said say to who he said say it when and how he said say it are you in the building with me here's what he said flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you but my father now God is a spirit and they that worship him must do what worship him in spirit and in truth, Job said, there is a spirit in man. It is the breath, watch, of Almighty that does what? Gives him understanding. See, you've talked about it a long time. You, you've sung songs about it and, and you've heard some preaching about it. But tonight, we're going to draw a line in the sand. And tonight is your night to break through. No. No, you didn't get it. I said tonight is your night to break through. Some of you have been butting your head against the wall long enough. Can you shout hallelujah? Some of you, some of you prayed long enough, hoped long enough, sung long enough, preached long enough, confessed it but not possessed it long enough. Is anybody in here ready for a breakthrough? See, a breakthrough, let me, let me break it down for you. A breakthrough is a sudden, don't be sitting there looking up in here at me like you don't need no sudden. Anybody in the building that can use some sudden? Raise your hand. I'm talking about the kind of breakthrough that before you get back home to your house, it's standing at the front door to welcome you back. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, 
Oh God, I'm feeling it now. A breakthrough is a sudden burst of the advanced knowledge of God or of revelation. Now a revelation does not produce a thing, a revelation uncovers a thing. And in other words, there's something that belongs to you that's been there all the time. No, see, he's not going to have to go get it for you. It's already there. <laughs> he's not going to have to go find it and manufacture it. It's already there. He's not going to have to pay somebody for it. It's already there. What he's going to do is take the covers off of it and show you. Just touch your neighbor and tell excuse me. I'm going to get mine. If you even halfway look like you might think about not wanting this blessing, this ain't no time to be cute. This ain't no time to be pretty. I'll knock you down and climb up your back and over your shoulders. I'll take my blessing and your shoe. Mm. Now, a sudden burst oh God, of the revelation knowledge of God. Now watch, when you get it, it's not just so you can tell somebody you got it. It's not so you can build you a new sermon. It's not you can show you and sing another song. No, no. A sudden burst of revelation knowledge, it comes to you. It's not coming to your mind. It's not coming through knowledge. It's coming by revelation. And God said, when it comes, it's going to propel you through every line of Satan's defense. That's the reason he said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father, but the Spirit of God. And here's what he said. And again I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon don't you preach me yet? And upon this rock. No, no, no. Upon this revelation. I will build my church. Good God, I'm glad he didn't say your church. Because there's some of his church in every church, but ain't no church all his church. Mm -hmm. Just look at your neighbor kind of suspicious like. See, cause you look real good. I heard you singing. You even tune real good. I, I saw you buck just a little bit. You got that down too. I saw you give just a little skip, and you got that down too. But uh, my Bible didn't say the race was to he that runs the swiftest. My Bible said he that endureth to the end. The same shall be saved. Just hold on, cause I'm getting real good and drunk right about now. Things about to get sloshy in here. <laughs> There's a revelation coming. And when you get it, it's going to break you through. Here's, what, here's the way Jesus said it. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you but my Father. And again I say unto you, thou art Peter, on this rock I'll build my church. Watch And the gates of hell shall not shall shall not shall not prevail against him what are the gates of hell anything trying to keep you out when god said you could go in I feel a breakthrough spirit. Some 
of you have been beating your head against the wall till your forehead is bloody. Mm, but tonight, God's going to say a thing. And when he does, you ain't even going to have to do nothing but hear it. And when you hear it, you're about to break through. Ah! It's my camp meeting and I feel a preach coming. You've been struggling long enough. You've been depressed long enough. You've been discouraged long enough. You've been in debt long enough. You've been in slavery long enough. You've been serving something but God long enough. It's breakthrough time. Break, 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 break. Joshua? I feel a breakthrough coming. woman in Exodus the Passover lamb in Leviticus our great high priest in numbers a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in Deuteronomy the prophet like unto Moses but in Joshua he becomes the captain of our salvation something happens in Joshua you will remember that Moses is dead Moses was raised up by God to become a deliverer of the people who were born in bondage are you with me as the hand of God begins to strike midnight at humanity's climactic consummation there seems to be emerging from the masses a remnant God's always had one you know he's always had an Elijah and Elisha and, 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 and David and a Daniel a, a Samson and a Samuel always a Shadrach a Meshach and a Bendigo that he refused to allow to become a part of the status quo religious organization 
nation of their day. And if he has always had a remnant, make no mistake about it, he certainly got one up in here tonight. There is somebody. I know I didn't come to talk to everybody. I, I understand that some of you don't understand. Some of you have never seen across Jordan's swelling tide. Some of you have been content with manna in the morning, manna in the noontime, manna in the evening too. But some of us don't mean no disrespect. We appreciate our shoes that didn't wear out. But the fact of the matter is we're tired of the same old pair of shoes. We, we have seen, oh God help me in here. We have seen just over Please don't tell me it's not that cause. Don't look now, but I can see it. <laughs> oh God, focus their eyes tonight. Let them understand that they are that third day generation. Let them begin to understand that what you have destined for them, their grandfather couldn't get to, their father couldn't get to. Let them understand you saved the best for last. Just touch your neighbor and say, now he's preaching about me right up in here, right now. You can play church if you want to. I want to be the church. Mm -hmm. I, I'm tired of what we've had. I, I don't mean no disrespect, but I'm tired. If there wasn't more than what we've had, how come he said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? If, if there's not more than padded pews and crystal chandeliers and Bella Lugosi organs played by some guy whose pants are entirely too tight, if there's not more than what we've had, then why did he ever say, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing, 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 shabbat. See, see, I didn't come to talk to everybody, but God give me somebody, somebody that's seen. Oh, I know you haven't been able to hold it yet. We'll get to that. But is there anybody here that's at least seen on the other side of Jordan's swelling tide? In the old covenant, they called it the promised land. But in the new covenant, we call it a land filled with promises. Is there anybody to go? You might just want to go. You might just want to touch your neighbor and say, excuse me, but I might need some packing peanuts before this night is over. I, I feel a move coming. The people that I'm talking about stand resolved to reclaim their spiritual authority and walk this earth in a Holy Ghost dominion that will eclipse that of a bygone millennium. Are you in this building with me? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the true measure of the stature of such a man is not how he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but how he stands in times of challenge and controversy. <laughs> You see, no man or woman are worth their weight who will not be willing at all times to sacrifice their body, their well-being, in fact, their very life itself for a cause of greatness. But we've been confused. Greatness is not assessed by the amount of money you acquire. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said greatness is not assessed by the amount of money you acquire. David Livingston said, I count nothing that I possess as anything, nor anything that I shall ever possess as anything, but that I might use it in my hand for the glorious work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. God, I'm preaching up in here. Mm. 
Greatness is not assessed by the degree of education you attain. Greatness is not assessed by the level of promotion you achieve. The greatness is assessed by our devotion to God, our dedication to family, and our determination while on our knees. Mm. Nothing great will ever be accomplished without great men and women, but men and women become great only as they have determined to be so. The men and women of whom I speak, they do not stumble at the feet of those they perceive to be greater than themselves. God deliver us from this damnable spirit of competition. Stumble because somebody said they were greater than them. Their ministry is bigger than Mailing list is bigger than On more TV stations. God's not keeping count. They do not cower in fear in the face of their critics. I want your approval, but I don't need it. <laughs> they do not despair over endeavors that they might have done better. Rather, they actually engage in the arena of conflict whose bodies bear the scars of a soldier, whose, whose minds attest to the advancing armies of their alien enemies, and whose spirits, good God, whose spirits know the untold glory and unrivaled grandeur of fighting for a righteous cause. Now, let's take a litmus test. I need to find out if I'm talking to you or not. I need to spy out some of y'all. See, am I talking about you? Because the people I'm talking about are actually inspired <laughs> by words like impossible. Now see, I, there went a third of them. No. They're inspired by words like incurable, insufferable insurmountable they're not called great because they never failed they're called great because even in failing they refuse to quit and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to find out am I talking to you that's alright honey it's free I dare you to shout, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. I'm the kind of person that sees a resurrection when I'm hanging on a cross. I'm the kind of person that when the doctors walk in and say you have to die and cannot live, get a shout of victory in my voice because I know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And regardless of how rounded my shoulders, regardless of how bloodied and bludgeoned my brow, regardless of how bent my back, you better not count me out because I know I'll live to fight another day. You can't stop me. You can't block me. You can't criticize me out. You can't point your finger at me enough times to shut me up. I know in whom I have believed. I am persuaded that neither height nor depth no principality, no power, no things present, no things to come, no peril, no nakedness, no sword shall be able to separate me from the... Sit down. Sit down. Touch your neighbor and tell him we are them out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses he told them to roast that lamb to eat all of it 
and do it with their shoes on. In other words, he said, make haste. Here's what he said. He said, hurry. Did you notice that? So when you're coming out, you've got to hurry. But when you're getting ready to go in, he's going to hold you. Now, I'm a crazy person. I like to ask God, how come? <laughs> Stuff like that just sticks in me. How come he made them hurry out and then they get all the way there and he makes them wait? See, it's not the coming out that causes us problems. It's that wait. It's that Mark 11, 22 to 24 wait. <laughs> Have faith in God. For truly I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall. They say he did. Said he shall. That's the weight of faith. Is there anybody in the weight? Am I the, am I the only one in here? Is, is there anybody in the weight? You mean to tell me you already in possession of every promise? Is that, is that what you want me to believe? You mean to tell me that there ain't nothing that you prayed for that hadn't showed up yet? Watch now. Oh, watch now, because it's about to get good. We're about to turn it up now. Because watch what it said. And they lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after, shout the next two words. Look up here at me. What did I just say? What did I just say? It came to pass after how many days? Three days. I don't need to talk to you about three days, do I? Can we fast forward in this so that I can get you on the other side? You do understand what happens on the third day. You do understand that on the third day, dead things live again. You, you do understand that on the third day, graves break open. You do understand. Dead marriages come to life. Dead children are raised up off the bed. Dead bodies receive the healing power of God. Dead checking accounts come to life. I don't have to tell you, do I? Do I? Do I have to tell you that this book says a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years? Do I need to tell you that when we stepped out of 2000 into 2001, God said I saved the best for last and he rang the bell on the third day. It is the third day. It is time to stop just bringing them out. Good God and start taking them in. Brother Dwight Thompson preached to you this morning about Mephibosheth. Can I tell you it's time for some of you to come out from underneath that table where you've been satisfied eating crumbs. Watch me. On the third day. Is that one of mine? You don't want me to talk about verse 3. No, I can't. I can't talk about when you see the Ark of the Covenant. Because we ain't seen it for a while. When you see... 
when you see the Ark of the Covenant. Watch me now. And the priests and the Levites bearing it. Good God Almighty, give us some preachers. I'm so tired of therapeutic philosophy in the pulpit that I don't hardly know what to do. I'm tired of counseling replacing deliverance. Yes, I am. I'm tired in the midst of an information explosion and instant internet access. I'm tired of this rush to download every new wind of doctrine, but delete foundational truth, dismissing it as yesterday's news. I'm so tired. We become like those on Mars Hill that Paul preached to, running in, always seeking some new thing. I just don't believe that eternal truth can be reduced to a 30-minute soundbite performed for the cameras by some people's choice of award-winning actor in a three-piece tailored suit speaking from the shallow cisterns of some new and improved form of the gospel. God, I'm preaching. Huh? Now watch this. Now watch this. Give us some preachers. When you see them, bear in that word. So you don't understand process. There's some of this stuff you can't get on your own. You don't understand process. Romans 10 said, how shall they call upon him whom they've not heard? believed how can they believe upon him whom they've not heard how can they hear without a preacher there's something in this that it has to be deposited in the fertile soil of a five-fold ministry apostolic prophetic gift and then flows back out to you and when it flows back out to you there's an anointing on it that you couldn't get any other way that man is anointed to is this a filing cabinet or a bible yeah, that man is anointed to break the seals off that book Watch. Watch. You ever find you a man of God, you better hold on to him. Don't let him go. Mm. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Uh. Bill, wait a minute. We can quit now. No, no, you better listen to me. Because if we take the next step, see, we're all right to right here. But if we take one more step, you can't get back. <laughs> want to go do you want to go are you sure you want to go I'm gonna find out in a minute did you really want to go are you ready are you ready you want to go why did he make them wait three days Well, it was in your Bible all the time, but let me just reveal it. And as they that bear the ark, I'm in verse 15, were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks,
Read the next five words out loud. All the time of Verse 17, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. How do we get there? Why did he make them wait three days? He was waiting to fulfill the destiny of his divinity. He was waiting until he could be who he said he was. He told them to call him Jehovah. Jireh, my provider. He told them to call him El Shaddai, the God who supplies before there's a need. <laughs> he made us wait. He sent that word of faith renewal and caused us through his word to begin to see it. I look in this book, I see my babies healed. I look in this book, I see my needs met. I look in this book, I see joy, blessing, peace, authority. But I couldn't get to it. God was holding me. He was saying, just a minute. It's almost ready. But the harvest that you're going to need, I don't want you having to go over there and wait. When I say, come on, the table will be set. The turkey will be cooked. Everything you need will already be there. When did it do it? When Jordan overflowed its banks all the time of harvest. Listen, at the time of the early and the latter rain, when they came all in one month, you couldn't tell was it a sowing rain or a reaping rain. God, God help me. God help me. He's not Alpha and Omega. He's not the beginning and the ending. He's Alpha. And Omega, Omega Alpha. His ending is swallowed up in his beginning. He said on the third day, I'm gonna lift my arm and tell you to come on and get it. It's already ready. The harvest is already there. <laughs> Amos chapter 9. While time remains, seed time and harvest. Poor translation. The and is not in the original text. While time remains, 
There's a seed time harvest. One word. A seed time harvest. A seed time harvest. A seed time harvest. Genesis 8.22 says it. Amos chapter 9 says, while time remains, Amos chapter 9 says, there will come a time when reapers, God let them see it. There will come a time when reapers will overtake sowers. When is that time? I just proved it to you. It's the third day. On the third day, reapers begin to overtake sowers. On the third day, before you can get the seed out of your hand, a harvest is already waiting. I'm not talking about a time where you've got to plant it and water it and weed it and wait and water and weed and wait. I'm talking about a time that before you get it out of your hand, the harvest is already. You can't stand it. Have I preached two hours? Because I quit at two hours. I didn't come to give you a sermon. I came to give you a revelation. Watch me. Are you wanting a miracle? Do you really need a breakthrough? Watch this. Watch this. Here's what's about to happen. There's about to be an overthrow. Here, here, let me say it another way. There's about to be a revolution, an uprising, an overthrow. In order to have a revolution, What's the root word? Revolve. In other words, to get where we're going, we have to go back to where we were. Alpha, omega, seed time, harvest. We have, in other words, if we will go back, we will be pushed forward. Listen. In the beginning, God had a son. Is that right? That son was named Adam. There was nothing outside the scope, the dominion, the domain of Adam was there. Nothing. Did he have a need that was not supplied? Nothing. God had a son. His name was Adam. Adam had a son. In fact, he had two, Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel. Eve said, give me a son to replace the righteous Abel. And God gave her Seth. God had a son named Adam. Adam had a son named Seth. Seth had a son named Mahalaleel, which being interpreted means to break through by ramming with the head. Mahalaleel had a son named Enoch. Enoch had a son named Methuselah. Methuselah had a son named Noah. Noah had a son who had a son who nine generations later gave birth to a son. His name was Abram. Abraham had a son. His name was Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was named Judah. Judah met up with a harlot. The less said about her, the better. Tamar. But that's what time's always been to God. Just a harlot. Father God, Mother Time. You have to listen. Yes. Judah and Tamar conceived. Came time for the birthing, we got trouble. A baby came down through the birth canal and stuck out its arm. How many of you understand that you've ever been in a birthing chamber? When the baby come out arm first, you got trouble. Hmm? The midwife grabbed that arm, wrapped a scarlet ribbon around it because the firstborn got the birthright. Everything the father had belonged to that baby. Suddenly, 
Because Tamar had conceived twins, that baby's arm was pulled back up in the womb. Now some folks say he pulled it back. That's crazy. What you forgot about was baby number two. Baby number two up in the womb reached down and grabbed baby number one by the nap of the neck and said, excuse me. Just touch your neighbor say, excuse me. Said, excuse me. But I'm not just about ready to sit up in here and let you take what rightly. But see, there's always been somebody trying to take your place. There's always been somebody trying to get out ahead of you. There's always been somebody trying to lay hold on what rightly. Baby number one grabbed baby number two by the nap of the neck, pulled it back, and came down head first. You know, that's just like the church. To try to accomplish by the arm of the flesh that which can be done only by his spirit. Baby number two came down through that birth canal head first and broke out of that womb. Some of you wondered why it's so dark, why it's so lonely, why there's so much pressure, why you try to go forward and get pushed back. You haven't understood you're coming down through the birth canal of Father God and Mother Time. You haven't understood that God's about to give birth to a brand new kind of believer that the world and the devil have never had to deal with before. You don't understand that your tight place, your little place, is just about to become an open place. You, you don't understand. Uh, he... They call that baby Perez. For he has broken through. He's only mentioned one other place in your Bible. Nehemiah chapter 11. They're getting to re-inhabit the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah has rebuilt the walls. And God says, don't let everybody in. Just touch your neighbor and say, I'm not sure about you. That's what he said. Don't let everybody in. Everybody can't go. Don't let everybody in. Don't let everybody in. But of the sons of Perez, of the sons of Judah, uh, you shall take 400, three score and eight valiant men, 468 valiant men. That word valiant just stuck in my craw. I said, what does it mean? God said it means valor. They were men of fearless courage. Don't have time to preach there. He said, number two, they were men of virtue, moral excellence. They, they didn't have a playboy underneath the seat of their preaching car. Help me, somebody. Come on, help me. You gonna stay with me or not? <laughs> Thirdly, they were men of overwhelming power. Don't have time to preach there. But the major characteristic of these men was very simple. Okay, because I'm gonna mess you up right now. Because you think it's because they prayed a lot and they preached a lot and they sang a lot and they were just nice people. But that's not what they were. The word actually bears out that they learned to overcome their adversary by reason of their wealth. No, no, no. No, you cut me off right there. You can, do you understand that there have been things sealed up I'm gonna preach in here Wednesday night a message that's just gonna absolutely mess you up hmm? I'm gonna preach on redigging the wells of our fathers but let me let me get this in right here truth in the first generation is welcomed as a conviction. Men would die for it. Ask William Seymour. 1906 when the Azusa Street Revival hit. If he would relegate the practices of Pentecost to the Sunday night service so we didn't offend those of more means in our Pentecostal congregation. He would die first. But by the second generation truth that was a conviction is now mm, an opinion open to debate by the third generation it's lost in institutionalization we enshrine it and no longer practice it 
and by the fourth generation it's lost altogether. This is the revelation of why God has saved the revelation knowledge of prosperity to the church until this generation. Because he could not allow it to be lost. God will perpetrate his will in the earth and he must supply into the hands of the people who will do it the means necessary to accomplish it. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to be one of those people. I'm going to be one of those people. I said, I'm going to be one of those people. Now, I'm going to mess you up right now. You need to understand that God has, oh, this isn't a new thing to God. It's just new to us, revelation. It's always been the way God operated. God has always delivered with a seed. That's how you got born again. With a seed. Oh, God. They're closing up on me now. I like this. I'm about to break this thing through. Mm -hmm. Just look at your neighbor and just very calmly say, I don't really need this. Go ahead. I just, I just don't really need this. Just touch your beautiful suit and say, I don't really need this. Think about that car you drove in here and say, I don't really need this. Think about that one bedroom flat you can't pay the rent on. Say, I, I don't really need this. Think about your bank account and what's in it and say, I don't really need this because I'm just about to mess you completely up because I'm going to show you right now where God said you were about to go. He revealed it to Moses before he anointed Joshua to do it. And God said when it's the third day, when I say it's time to go possess the land, here's what I'm going to give you. And it shall be when the Lord thy God God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities. No, no, no. No, no, no. So you think, you're still thinking it has something to do with you and it don't have anything to do with you. It has nothing to do with, but God set his clock and said, when it's the third day, I'm doing this, whether they like it or not. He said... I'm going to give you great and goodly cities. You see this building around here? It seats 5,200 people. When we have breakthrough crusades, we can't use a building seating less than 20,000 people. So I got angry. I said, what in the world am I doing every Sunday morning of my life in a 5,200 seat building and when I get outside Columbus anywhere, I got to have 20,000 seats. What's wrong with this? And God said, you've been satisfied. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Have I belabored this? Is this all right? Everybody just looks so tired and, and I feel so good. Dwight, I got tired. They just built a brand new 22,000 seat arena in Columbus. It's for hockey. Hockey. They got marble walls. Marble. Oh, Jesus. They got, they got a park. Yeah, for hockey. So I made me an appointment. And I went down there. I asked to speak with the head man, but he wasn't in, so they gave me the second in charge, and he said, oh, Pastor Parson, we're so glad to see you, so delighted you could come. We, we, were, we are ready now to show you our building. I said, no, excuse me. I didn't, I didn't come to see your building. See, so you're looking at me funny. They said, oh, well, we're sorry, perhaps you'd like to talk with our leasing office. You'd like to lease our building for your camp meeting. No, I'm not interested in leasing your building. Well, Pastor Parson, we're just a little confused. Why have you come? And I looked at him with some disbelief and said, I came for you to show me my building. See, you 
look at me. See, you look at me. But I'm already living in my miracle, and you standing there looking across Jordan at yours. They laughed at me when I was over yonder and said I was going to be over here. See, I wish you'd just tell me I can't because it inspires me. See, because here's the thing. They have $50 million in buildings around here. But every one of them, you see this right here? This little, this little piece of decoration right here costs $150,000. Right here. This thing hanging, looking at me, costs $150,000, and there's six of them in here right now. And every one of them, I had to pray and sweat and work and believe and pray and sweat and work and believe and they all showed up but the shouting news is he's going to give me cities read the next line that I didn't have to build I feel it yes I do everybody shouting right now I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here. 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 Yes, I do. You've not been left out. I saw you before you left home, saith the Lord. And that which you came seeking shall be supplied seven times greater than you have had the capacity to ask me, saith the Lord. I hear the words of my father Andrew Murray I hear him declaring to you in the spirit see to it that you do not limit God not only by your lack of faith but by fancying that you can fathom what he desires to do in you lift up your hands right now and say greater greater than I ever dreamed greater than I've ever spoken, greater than I've ever been able to believe, it shall be mine by the hand of God. I heard your Holy Spirit. Come here, Stephanie. Come here, Stephanie. Come here, Stephanie. For an appointed time, an appointed season, a moment, Swallowed up in my everlastingness, saith the Lord, have I brought you even into this season. And it is not a barren one, but one full of fruit, overflowing abundance, flowing out of that which you have already birthed before you step foot in this place. So shall I establish it, saith the Lord, and nations shall rejoice. Worship him, 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 worship him. You got that seed in your hand? You got that seed in your hand? You got that seed in your hand? I dare you to throw it and say breakthrough. I said breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. I said breakthrough, breakthrough. Pick it up and get up here and throw it on this altar right now. In the name of Jesus, I dare you. I dare you to get out of your complacency. I dare you to make a move toward God. I dare you to establish your faith. Somebody shout for me. Push your way through. Don't you? Don't you? It's too easy to pass a plate. I dare you to push your way through in an act of faith. In the name of Jesus, approach the altar of God and tell the devil, you better back in your up, company devil. Again, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing that you are doing all over the world. And I don't know how many men stop to tell you, but let me just stop and say how much we in the body of Christ love you 
and appreciate you. Thank you. For what you are doing all over the world. We honor you and we esteem you. Now, I know you are all the time moving. Yes. And uh, you just stopping through here for a minute on your way somewhere. Where right. are you? Where are you going? Well, I'm, I'm busy getting prepared. We've got thousands and thousands of men coming from all over the country, literally all over the world, yes. to Dallas this week for manpower. First time I'm hosting it in my home city. Right here. With the support of my home church all around me. It's just in fact that some of them are here tonight. Well, yeah, we yeah. got, they are in the house. Yeah, they're. Uh, well, one of, one of the great things you have to know about the Potter's House is that they're church junkies. I mean, it's the only place I've ever been where you just almost have to make them go home. I mean, they're, they're, they're here tonight, and we've got Bible class on Wednesday night, and they'll be out there then, and then Manpower starts Thursday night okay. at the Reunion Arena here in Dallas and run all day Friday and all through Saturday morning. And then we're going to have crazy church all day Sunday. All, all day Sunday. You know, yeah. so, you know, it's just wonderful. Well, I, I think... <clears throat> I, I think there's probably a good reason why they're church junkies, because you're, you're in the house usually preaching, yes. and uh, your ministry is just so magnetic. So, Manpower starts this week. Yes, it starts Thursday night, and, and our theme this year is Men of Honor, and uh, I'm really, really excited about it, because I, I was explaining to someone, I said, it is not so much that we are saying that we are Men of Honor, it is that the, I, I really believe that the body of Christ needs to redefine role models. Okay. You know, we're always looking for role models and who's a role model, who's not a role model. Right. But I think the church has already chosen its role model. Uh, and that's Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. You yes, see? Sir. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he is our he is ultimate Absolutely. our ultimate role model. And what we're trying to do is aspire to be like him. Right. And so men are coming together literally from everywhere uh, to spend time. I'm going to be ministering. We'll be uplinking by satellite into prisons. We spent our ministry alone spent a half a million dollars last year in prison ministry, prison reform, reaching through the bars, touching people that that others seem to have forgotten about, but are very very significant. Many of these young men, if we don't invest in rehabilitating them, yes. they they come out incorrigible. They're not really delivered and set free, and they go back again, uh, but not without mugging, raping, and killing those of us that are on the outside. Come on. And, and while our government has spent millions, literally billions of dollars in incarcerating these young men, we need to start to spend more in rehabilitating them. Yes, it's, it's very, very important. Amen. And I say men, but it's really women too. Right. And, and it's, not, it's, it's not limited by gender. It's not limited by race. This transcends all of that. Blacks, whites, Hispanics, all types of people find themselves incarcerated. Right. And so we uplink by satellite into those prisons, and in several of those prisons, we interface back and forth because I've got ministry teams stationed in various places of the country interfacing with us in the service. So yes. it is an interactive uh, technology that allows us to do that. We're really excited about that. I, I remember uh, one time when you did A Woman Now Are Loosed, and we shared with you from Chino. I thought, what? a tremendous idea to have ministry right there on site. So you're not just coming in, you're actually sending people in That's right. to touch them while they're being ministered to. Well, well, we've had thousands of men to receive, men to, and women to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be saved, to be reclaimed, guards, yes. wardens, staff members, that make any difference. Holy Spirit will reach them all, will reach them all. <laughs> well, you know, you know once, what, what, the, the creative aspect of the way that you have positioned yourself to go in. Once you get in, the Holy yes. Spirit is free to move in That's those right. environments and in those arenas. And I don't care what kind of bars are up, what kind of divisions are up, the Holy Spirit will penetrate through all of those. He definitely And will. bring deliverance. And you have been a master of doing that. Again, we salute you uh, for that. And, and so uh, you're, you're uplinking yes. uh, through satellite yes. into the prisons yes. with uh, the, the Manpower Conference. With the Manpower Conference. And, and we're going to pull their service down into our meeting so that the men actually can interface. The amazing thing that happened <laughs> uh, last year, I think it was at Woman Art Loose, Kirk Franklin was on the stage singing yes. and ministering. And we didn't know that the very prison that we had uh, mm -hmm. downlinked into was a prison where his sister was incarcerated. And when he heard that, it, it just really touched him and really, really blessed him because there's not a one of us who doesn't know somebody or related to somebody who's, right. who's somewhere in, in, in incarcerated. And, and so it's very, very important. Because I believe that Jesus is the answer. Yes, sir. I believe yes, that he sir. is the yes, answer. Sir. I yes. believe that he is the answer. Absolutely. And, uh, 
I'm excited to be able to do that. We've got about 400 voices uh, of, of men in our choir. Our men's choir is gonna be all across the auditorium singing, wow. lifting up the name of the Lord. And it's something about when men see men praising no God. No doubt about it, Bishop. It's something no, about, no doubt about it. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. No doubt about it. You, you know, uh, I was teaching some time ago and I was dealing with men and dealing with, you know, the Bible speaks about the man being the head and that yes. word in Greek is capita, from which mm. we get the English word capital, which mm -hmm. literally means the handle or the seizable part. Yes. If God is going to do something powerful in and through the church in our generation, he's going to have to pick up the thing by the handle, the right. seizable part. And, and what you are doing with men affects not only the men, it right. affects their homes, yes. it affects the church, yes. it affects the community, the culture, the society, because if you can get a handle on the handle, right. you can pick the whole thing That's up exactly right. and turn it around. That's exactly and so, right. It's awesome. You know, also, uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited. We talk a lot about Woman Art Loose, and I'm excited about going to New Orleans to do Woman Art Loose this year, and it's, it's just about 30 days after manpower. But, but to me, you. manpower is Woman Art Loose because many, many times, if you get that handle, yes. and you get that man turned around, or that son turned around, that husband, that daddy turned around, that woman will be loose. Absolutely right. That woman that, will that, be loose. That, yeah, no, that's, that's true. You know? That's true. And, and, and I think that... Many of the struggles so that we're seeing in our society today are a result of a fatherlessness, uh, absentee fathers, workaholic fathers, uh, men who are distracted and out of place. Right. Uh, it's very, very important that we restore them without criticizing them. So the, true. You know, we don't want to get into male bashing. We want to get into male lifting. You know, that, that is really important what you say. Go ahead. I'm well, sorry. well, it's critical because so many times men will shrink away where they're bashed. Right. And, and there are good, godly Christian women who are watching right now who are at their wits end, don't know what to do. And they've spoken to their husbands and spoken to their brothers and spoken to their dad about coming to Christ. They can't figure out what's what's going on. But the Bible says that the woman is able to win him without a word. Right. Because nagging doesn't draw men. It repels them. Hear it this. pushes them away. If you want him to come in, <laughs> I got a big amen, boy, glory to God. And, and, and the, the woman doesn't understand, and one of the reasons the women don't understand that it's not that she means to nag, it is that it is a proven fact that women process by talking. Right. Whenever a woman has a problem, she wants to talk. Baby, we need to talk. You know, let's talk about it. The right. thing the man least wants to do is talk about it. Right, right, okay? right, right. Because we don't need to talk to process uh, our thinking. And, and so when the woman, she doesn't mean to nag, she's trying to process the problem. I see. Yeah. It comes across to him as nagging. Right, He's right. processed it's, somewhere else. Yes. You, yeah, you, know, yes, you know, I'm going to wash the car. Yeah. Then the woman feels rejected because she says, why are you leaving me? He's not leaving her. He's leaving the way she processes. Ah. And, and so it, we, we tell couples Let's to communicate, but we don't tell them that they, they don't speak the same language. Same language, that's right. And so, so wh whereas the woman verbalizes, men use nonverbal communication. Okay. If a man likes another guy, he doesn't come up and say, man, I really like you. You know, he, he may go, man. You know, bruh, <laughs> right, I'm yeah. down for you. Right, you, know, right, right, right. you know, you know, you know, he, he doesn't like that, you know. Right. Or, or, or in, in corporate America, there's the one-handed shake, there's the two-handed shake. Men have all these signals we give by handshakes. There, there is the light, superficial shake, you know, that basically says, you know, I don't want to be bothered. Right. Then there's the macho shake where you try to squeeze his hand off to let him know, you know, you a man. Yeah, I'm a man. Right, you know? right, right. And, and then there's the intimate handshake when a man shakes you by the hand and then gives you his other hand, right. that means, you know, I really like right. you. We both. All, all of this is done without saying a word. Without a word. Yeah, we don't have to. And so the Bible says that the woman can win him without a word. Ah, uh, Bishop, Bishop. And it's critical that we understand that. Yeah. It's critical that we understand that. And so the woman says, you know, I'm at my wit's end. I've witnessed to him. I've left tracks around the house. I've talked to him about what he needs to do. I've written Jesus in lipstick on the mirror while he's shaving, you know, and he, he's not getting it. Yeah. But when he walks into a room, I don't care whether he's roughneck or corporate, it makes no difference because our ministry spans from one extreme to the other, yes, from, the, from the very rough and fragmented to the very intellectual and corporate. It doesn't matter. If he walks into a room where other men are worshiping and praising God. He doesn't feel predisposed to be macho. He's not on guard. He's not trying to impress his wife or companion. And he begins to do something that is very difficult for men to do. And that is to open up. Yes, sir. 
just, to just release. Women do it so much easier than we do. Yeah, they do. You know, they they, do. they've been given permission all of their lives to, to, they can cry and it's still feminine. The very first thing we start telling little boys is don't cry, be a man. Right, right. You know? And, and they then, equate that with being a man. With being a man. Right. Then 20 years later, they say, you know, be sensitive. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, the guy is schizo, you right, know? Right. He, do, he doesn't know whether to cry or not to cry, to release or not to release. And, 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 and he's got yeah. all of these issues. All of these issues. The sad thing about it is men are dying up to 10 years earlier than women. Far more prone to have heart attacks, hypertension, diabetes. They're stressing out yes. because they do not release. There's something about praising God. Yes, sir. Yes, that sir. releases you physically, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. Woo. It does it. Truth. It vents you. It lets the steam off. It lets the pressure off. Yes, and, so, and so when, when you see these men coming together into these conferences and into these meetings, they come with an agenda. It's not, uh, sometimes in the women's meetings, they're all, they're all dressed up, you know, and everybody has to have their nails done and everything. But with the men, it's kind of different. Right. You know, you, you'll see a couple of guys in suits. You'll see somebody in blue jeans. You'll see somebody cut off shorts. It's a whole different dynamic. And when they come together and worship God, and in fact, they're going to show just, just a clip because there may be somebody watching who has never seen uh, the manpower service. Yes, sir. But they're going to show just a clip of it. And I want you to see what is going on behind closed doors Let, at let's, Manpower. Let's go to it. This is Manpower, yes. uh, previous Manpower conference. Yes. All right. And the only feeling that we can get you to express is anger. You have trouble saying, I love you. You have trouble saying, I need you. You have trouble being a light in your house and an enjoyment to your family because you think being masculine means being tough. You can't express any other emotion, but you're good at anger. And you're raising up a child who's acting like you. Some of you who've got your little boys having tantrums and tearing up stuff and you keep getting called down to the school because little Jimmy can't be controlled and they keep holding him back and they call him BD and they're calling him dysfunctional and you can't figure out what's wrong with him and you keep beating him and beating him and beating him. I came to tell you what's wrong with little Jimmy. He's acting just like his daddy. Oh my, my goodness. I'm not afraid to just lay it on the line. I mean, well, you men, you, you just cut to the chase. Well, you know? you, Bishop, it, it, is, it is so important. And, and the, thing about, the thing that I love about it, and I, I've watched, I, I have gotten the tapes because I, I haven't been able to be at many of the conferences, but I've gotten the tapes. The thing that I love about what you do is that there really is the Father heart of God coming through you as you minister. There is a, a paternal ministry that is going on. And, and as I listen, you know, so many men, as you said, uh, have not been brought up in patriarchal homes. Mm -hmm. We've got 70 to 75 percent of uh, especially men of color in this hour being brought up in matriarchal homes. Mm -hmm. They have not seen. That's not to negate the validity of the mother's influence, but we really many times have not had paternal influence to relate to. Exactly. And uh, many of the examples that, that we have had have not been the ones we want to mark, and yet we end up uh, becoming just like them. Exactly. Because of all the pressure that society puts on men. What would you say to men who are watching right now? They're trying to decide, should I come to manpower oh. or, or, or not? Will it help me or not? I've been to church, I've talked to this one, been to that one. What is different about what I'm going well, to do? Well, one of the things that's unique about manpower is even, I've seen men come to manpower and not want to leave. I mean, the meetings are over and the guys are hugging each other and crying and, and, and just really hanging around because it is very difficult for a man to confront himself. Yes. He can confront his enemy, he can confront his boss, he can confront his neighbor, but to confront himself is very, very difficult. Yeah. When, when you start talking about being fatherly, uh, let me give you the behind the scenes story on that. First of all, I, I grew up in a situation where I needed to be fathered myself. Yes. My father got sick when I was 10 years old. Okay. He died when I was 16. Right in the middle of my adolescence, he was gone. I was confused, I was at the end of my rope, frustrated. It took me years to realize that the best way to get healed from what you didn't get 
This is very important. This is going to help a lot of men. It's going to help a lot of women across the board. Makes no difference who you are. The best way to be healed from what you didn't get is to give to somebody what you wanted yourself. Oh, my God. Yeah. You see what I'm That's saying? powerful. Yes. Say, say that again. Say that one more time, Bishop. The, the best way to be healed from what you didn't get is to give to somebody else what you wish you had gotten yourself. I hear you. I hear and you. what the person doesn't know is that as you give it away, it is just what the Bible says. It is given back to you. Yes, sir. Good measure, pressed Press down, down shaken together, together and running over. over. Yes, sir. So if you need a father, be a father. Sow it, yeah. Yeah, if you need a friend, be a friend. If you need a father, be a father. If you need finances, give it away. What, if you need love, give love. Whatever you need the most, give it out. Yeah. And I started giving a fatherly spirit because I needed it. I hear you. And in the process of giving it away, it boomerangs. My God. It comes right back to you. And, and it looks like you're helping the person. But all the while, it's coming back to it's you. It's coming back to you and it's helping you. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. It, it, is, a, it is a spiritual law. Yes. You, you can't help but receive it if you sow it. But I, I'm also listening to the man who says, well, Bishop, but I don't, I don't know how to be a father. I, right. I, I don't even know how to sow it. You're right. Uh, I, I don't have any example. I don't, what would you say to that? You, you know, there's m many things. I had to get in the Word of God to, for God to finish fathering me. Because, I hear you. you know, I, I wasn't fathered. I wasn't finished. I had a lot of questions. Uh, my father told me when he was dying, he said, by the time I figured out what life was all about, it was time to go. And I thought, oh gosh, I gotta beat that. I gotta figure it out quicker than that. I did, and so I reached, I got my Bible, and I started digging the Bible. I never started studying the Word to preach. I hear you. I never had a clue that I was going to preach. I opened up this book trying to find some medicine some to keep myself alive, and some answers to the craziness going you. on in my head. Me too, Bishop. And out of the reservoir of the medicine that I found that began to minister to me, mm. I began to share with other people mm. what was helping me. Yes, sir. And as I I begin to share with other people, I found out several things. First of all, that the word is an antidote, okay? Second of all, that I was not by myself. Yeah. That, that, that and, everybody's dysfunctional. And that's a, gr <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a great release when you just, yes, yeah. Yes, everybody's, the, the whole concept of normal is a myth. The normalcy doesn't exist. Normalcy is, is a charade that we play before people that we might gain acceptance. Uh. Behind the mask, all of us have issues. We have issues, Preach and I'm waiting on the church to finally tell the truth. It's time. We all have yeah. issues. We do. We do. Yes, sir. We do. Yes, sir. You know, and, 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 and when I first got saved, I was saved and, and, and taught old-fashioned holiness. And, and the whole idea of old-fashioned holiness movement was to get a church full of perfect people and teach a perfect gospel and get, get people to live perfectly and then have a perfect place. And, and it never does work because the only way to have a completely perfect church is for everybody to leave and lock up the door. Preacher too. Everybody. Preacher, bishop, everybody got to go. Everybody go. Leave nobody in there but Jesus. Yeah, and then it's perfect. Then it's perfect. Flawless, yeah. But the moment you bring humanity in here, yes, sir. the very reason we feed you the Word of God is so you can grow. Anything that can grow, it is an implication that it is not finished and it has not arrived. The reason God doesn't grow is that he's already perfect. I got you. And he cannot be improved upon. Yes, sir. Anything else has to grow because it is not there yet. I got you. And so if, if the church were complete, there'd be no need for preaching. We need to come out of the closet and tell people we are not there yet and that we are worshiping Jesus, not preachers, not bishops, not television, Say evangelists, on. none of it, none of it, none no. of it. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus alone. Absolutely. And so... I'm excited. You can tell I'm well, excited I, well, about it. You, you excite me. I, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I came, and it's interesting that you say that because I came sort of from the other day. I had a, a father who was an exemplary role model, mm -hmm. uh, one who taught me everything uh, that he could possibly teach me, and I'm grateful for it. He was many years older than me, and uh, uh, when, I, when he passed away, I was just about getting to the age where I now knew the questions I should have asked. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so, so uh, he passed away and I was just coming into my 20s. And I'll never forget when I went into the presence of God and I said, you know what, uh, Lord, I, I don't know how to be, although I've had this example, and I'm speaking to men because there are some men who have had 
fathers right. and good role models, right. and yet they themselves don't have everything that they have need of. Right. And they're finding that the society and the dynamics of the situations that they're involved with are much more complex than what their father dealt with anyway. Well, w w let me interject something because I'm going through this with my sons. Uh -huh. When your father is this larger than life person, his persona becomes intimidating. Yeah. Some t somehow you feel like you can never live up to what he was. I had such a, but situation. you are looking at him through the eyes of a child. And through the eyes of a child, your father can do anything. Yeah. He can leap tall buildings. He can lift cars out of ditches. I mean, he is Superman. Yeah. And if he had lived long enough for you to get to be friends with him, you would find out that he was a guy like you. That he had fears and insecurities and you wouldn't be intimidated. Yeah. And my, my oldest sons are just now getting to the point, they're, they're 21 years old, very where, where I'm, I'm through training them, I'm through raising them, and now we have the luxury of becoming friends, uh -huh. and I get to tell them what I really felt like yes, sir. When, when I was leaping over the building. What you couldn't you know, say. Before. I was scared to death, you know? I almost lost my mind, I almost yes. fainted, I fell, I tripped, you know, I skinned my knee, I cried all night long on your mama, you didn't even hear me, I got up the next day and went to work. Right. And they began to understand masculinity and manhood in particular is an attainable objective right it can be reached even with a crippled hand mm. even with a crippled hand mm. when jesus touched the man with the withered hand he taught him how to stretch beyond his limitations yes sir and that's what the gospel is all about touching withered hands so a man can stretch yeah beyond, beyond his, his limitations. limitations and this is why i'm 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 so except what well, yeah you can clap for that i believe yeah. that's mm -hmm. that's a word I, I believe that's a word. The, the thing that is so vital and the thing that is so significant and the reason I am so grateful that you are doing what you're doing is because with all of the other information and the intelligence and the presentation uh, that you are able to present, the one thing that you can always count upon when you listen to T.D. Jakes is he is going to, at the end of all that, connect you with Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and so many, amen. And, and so many times, we, we, I say we major in minors and, and we miss the actual important thing. All of this other diagnostic uh, stuff is important, but you have to connect them to Jesus. And I appreciate that about you. I, I was... Uh, I was studying uh, some time ago, and I, I was watching the dynamic of Joseph, uh, you know, when, when he is dealing with this whole, this whole thing oh. about Mary. And, and you know, and, and, uh, you know she tells him, uh, I'm with child of the Holy Ghost, and he's like the holy who, and right. he's about to put her away, right, right, right. and like, sure, and this has never happened before. And if you study that story out, and here is the man who is given the responsibility of being the earthly patriarch, right. at least stewarding this child, this boy Jesus. And each time when he has a question, what I noticed is this, when he waits just a moment, the father appears to him in a dream mm -hmm. or an angel of the Lord comes to him and speaks to him. He doesn't know what to do. When Herod's about to kill all, all the babies, he doesn't know what to do. But the angel of the Lord shows up. And I was reading that one day in the spirit of God when I was saying, God, I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to do this. I don't know. He said to me, he said, you don't have to know what to do as long as you're connected to the God who does. Yes. You, 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 don't, yes. You, don't, you don't have to know how to be a father you're right. as long as you're connected right. to the father. And one of the greatest releases that I received and I believe any man watching us can receive in that is when we go before God and we say, you know what? I don't know. Teach me how. And this is one of the things that I have noticed about what you do. Not only do you diagnose the problem, open it with intelligence and spirituality, but at the end, you hook people to Jesus. And Jesus is the power that delivers and sets free and changes and transforms. You, you know something that's funny because uh, back there, they, they have just a piece of a clip. There was, at that same meeting that we were at last year, we were dealing with anger and repressed rage. Mm -hmm. And as we began, at, at first when I started dealing with this anger, it was just, just like, ice cold, but something broke in that service. Mm -hmm. And as it broke in that service, men began to respond. Yes, sir. They began to react. They were dealing with their anger. They were dealing with their frustrations. Yeah. 
And, and you can see what begins to happen. Yeah. It's, they begin to run to the altar. My, 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 You're talking my. about connecting with Jesus. Woo. Thousands of men. Jesus. Thousands of men coming from every direction, falling on their knees. Oh, my God. Seeking God, calling yeah, on his yeah. name, the presence of God. Yeah. Men were filled with the Holy Ghost. Men were delivered, delivered from addictions and yes, bondages, sir. wife beating, molestations, abuse, this. depression, fear, coming, filling that stadium, running, running literally on the, the run on the run to get to Jesus. <laughs> Preachers were slain in the spirit. Woo. Deacons were filled with the Holy It doesn't matter who you are, you can have problems. My God. Order. Look at God. Look at what my, God is my, able to my, do. My, my, my. It's, it's a powerful thing. Come on, let's That's praise God. Praise because God. God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey. Glory. Ah, oh, bless you. Yeah, I'm not I feel his presence. Woo. Oh, glory, glory, hey. glory, 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 ah. glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody just lift your hands and praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's what's coming to Dallas. Yes, sir. That's what's coming to the reunion arena. That's what thousands of men are coming for. And what men don't do, sometimes we don't take off, well, I got to go to work, and well, I don't know about this. Look. If you have to get on a bus, if you have to get a cab, if you have to get on a scooter, we need those men in that place. God is going to do something life-changing, life marriage healing, thirst quenching, mind renewing. I mean, a gully washing, downpouring, outpouring of the Holy Ghost is going to fall in that place. Right, right, right here in Dallas. Right here in Dallas. Start Thursday night. Right here in Dallas starts Thursday night oh, at God. the reunion. It might have started tonight, but I feel, <laughs> I feel, I feel, I feel it's something. It's on, Bishop. Oh, God. It's on. I feel something. It, it oh, might do this. It might Don't start tonight. Do Don't it do this. It might start tonight. Don't do this. Don't I feel the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Hey! We've been praying. We've been getting ready. We've been yeah. fasting. It's been on, Bishop. God. It's here. It's on. It, Run to the little it's, shita. It's on you. Yes. It's on that tape. It's on you right now. Go, go, talk, you, talk. You know talk. what? You know what? The spirit of God is moving in this place. The anointing is moving. God's glory is in this place. Don't let the devil tell you that your situation is hopeless. That you can't be healed. That you can't be changed. You may have fallen. You may have stumbled. You may have embarrassed yourself. Get back up. Brush yourself off. My God. Get, get back in there, man. Get back in there. God is not through with you yet. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your life. And, and when, when, when I'm going to minister Thursday night, I'm going to be ministering Friday night. Bishop Olmer's going to be Kenneth there. Olmer. Bishop Kenneth Olmer from California, a Mighty preaching man, machine. Yes, he's, he's a great blessing to the body of Christ. He's going to be there, Bishop Eddie Long. Oh, my goodness. Flying in from Atlanta. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just going to be awesome. We've got great singing. We've got great ministry. Most of all, Jesus is going, going to, be to be in there. the house. Now, if I want to, if, if I want, it's not too late for me. Is there a registration? It's not Let too late. Let me explain. There is no registration. There was a $20 preferred seating that was available. And if you wanted preferred seats, you can get them. Right. But, but it is open seating as long as it lasts. Come as you are. Yeah, just come. Don't be afraid to bring anybody. This is not, I want to say this, this is not a black thing. Right. This is not a white thing. This is not a brown thing. This is a Jesus, Jesus thing. thing. All of his people are welcome. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, I, I tell you what. I, I tell you what. It, it is on. It is electric right here. Yes. And I know the anointing of God is going to be moving powerfully in the reunion. Listen, it, I, let me just say this to you. If you are anywhere that you can get to Dallas, you need to get to Dallas. Because I'm telling you, this man is on fire right here. And I, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm in a conference right now in Detroit, as, as you well know, with the, but I, I may just try to sneak <laughs> over on Friday. If you can find me a seat somewhere, I just, find just seat. I in, will save you a seat. In, anywhere in the place. Just I will I save you a seat. Let me, let me share something Absolutely. Uh, with you. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and to be on with you and uh, to have my friends and brothers and sisters here Amen. Uh, in the house of the Lord. Got some uh, deacons in the house and just, just some, <laughs> some great people. I, I, I think that, uh, I love you too. Uh, 
I, I tell you, it's a blessing to be where you are loved. Yes, sir. Where you are appreciated and not tolerated. Mm. It makes a lot of difference in the level that your gifts can operate. That is so true. And, and I really do think that there's going to be a, a special anointing because it is in Dallas. Because I'm home. Yeah. I'm in my element. Yeah. You, yeah. you understand? And, I'm in my element. And your uh, that, cherubim that, that, will be around. Yeah, that you. same Glory. anointing, yeah. you know, is, is on our staff and on our people. And, 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 uh, and it's just exciting. I, I believe that God is going to release, a, a trim, particularly for pastors. I want to challenge pastors to come. Don't just send your men, but to come also. Because we seldom get a moment off duty. Truth where we can bask in the glory of God Truth. and just be strengthened and be renewed and come back on fire Truth. without worrying about who's going to lock up and who's going to play and the organist didn't show up. Let me worry about all of that. Right, right, right. You just come on out and let the Holy Ghost bathe your soul and we need it. We in, need it. in the presence of the Lord. And, and it is a men's conference. It's, it's not that women cannot come, but it is, it is special when men get a chance to get away f from everybody for a minute right. and be refreshed. And the women's conference is coming up. But, but I want to share this scripture. Yeah, come to New Orleans and get some catfish, girl. <laughs> get you some catfish and some Jesus in New Orleans. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Amen. W when is that, Bishop? Yeah, when is that? Yeah. When is let, let, let me have them pull the dates because I'll give them the wrong dates. But okay. I'm, I'm going to be in no, New Orleans for Woman Art Loose. Woman Art Loose Plus right. starts on that Wednesday. And then Woman Art Loose starts that Thursday night and runs through Saturday morning. It's going to be a great meeting. Over 40,000 women have already registered for preferred seats. For preferred seats. For preferred seats. And, but don't worry. We've got room. You we've got, got room. We, we can handle about 80,000 before we say. In the uncle. Superdome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're at the Superdome, and we got the lakefront for overflow. Plenty so I'm not scared. Come place. on down. Get, get on the bus, Gus. Don't discuss much. <laughs> Amen. Come on down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a great meeting. <laughs> and it's August the 8th through the 11th. <laughs> August the 8th. You know, I'm from West Virginia. I understand. Uh, it's August 8th through the 11th, and every woman in the nation, in the world, needs to come. We have had up to 70 and 80 women already registering from Africa, from Johannesburg, from Nigeria. They're coming from London. They're coming from Japan. My Lord, Bishop. They're coming from Venezuela. You, you know, we, uh, we uplink by, by satellite at the women's meeting also. I've been teaching Bible class in my Bible class streams on the internet every week and so we're picking up more and more people yes. from Switzerland and, and from all over the world who are in my Bible class via the, via internet, the internet every week and so they're coming and they're emailing and they're coming from everywhere awesome. and I believe that if the men get healed at manpower and the women get renewed at woman art loose the family's got to be restored, got to be restored. it's got to be restored and the church will be on fire the church will be on, on fire. fire and I, I want to share this with you because I shared this um, uh, in the 11 o'clock service at our, our at our church, and I just want to, your house. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, I believe it's it's Mark 11:24, and 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 I shared this scripture. I was going to preach something else. I'd preach something else at eight o'clock, and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit sat down so strong in the 11 o'clock service that there was no preaching you could do. I the Spirit of God just moved, and, and, and this old song that the old folks used to say, Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, I thank you all the days of my life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Lord, I that's thank going you. Back. Thank, you know, that's back yeah, that's, in the day. Yeah, that's going back. But we went in. I see. We were way back. I mean, we went all the way under. There's power in Oh, some it's of something old, about that old stuff I mean, now. Now, don't, well, don't get, get me started. started. On that. Yeah. Because I mean, that's, that's what I came through off of that, you know. I understand. And we got to walk on the floor singing that. And the Lord spoke to me while we were singing, while we were singing. And he said, I'm going to do in this place a, a Mark 11:24." And I got my Bible. And Mark 11:24 says this, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Yes, sir. And I said, Lord, what do you mean a Mark 11, 24? He said, whenever somebody hands you something, like a, a, a $20 bill or a gift or something, when you receive it, you automatically say thank you. Right. Okay? So he said, the reason I've got you saying thank you, thank you, thank you, and the praise has gone all through the house, is that the things that you've been praying for, uh, and you haven't even received them yet. He said, but I want you to go ahead and thank me on credit. Glory to God. Thank me, thank me as if it were already done. 
thank me as if it had already yeah. happened. Call it thank done you. right thank now. You. Thank you. And, uh, thank thank I'm you. Sorry, but I feel something. No, I, I, know, I know this is too much. Don't apologize. But you know something? We Yay. started thanking God for things that hadn't even happened yet. And, and, why, and, and, and see, uh, yeah, yeah, when, yeah. when you look at 1120, uh, 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 can you feel this? See, see. Uh. Go on, Bishop. See, see, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray. Yes, sir. Not after you pray, when you pray. When you pray. Believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. Yes, sir. And see, the only thing better than 1124 is 1123. For 1123 begins to talk about that if you have the faith yes, sir. as of a grain of mustard seed, right. you can speak to the mountain. Yes, sir. And the mountain will move. Yes, sir. Well, while we were praising God, and see, I'm from West Virginia. See, down here in Dallas, there, there's no mountains. No mountains. It's plain. Yeah, everything's just flat. Right. You can just see all the way to Jerusalem, just from your backyard, you know. Not a mountain anywhere. But I grew up with, with mountains all around me. Right. And while we were worshiping, I saw mountains running. I saw mountains running. And, and, and I mean running, they were just, just running, right, right. almost like a cartoon, running. And, 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 and it, just think, if you have a faith seed, any kind of seed, any kind of giving, we start sowing seeds. We just start sowing 11.24, just 11.24, so just a little seed. Wow. But the seed started chasing mountains. Thanks. See, a seed, think yes, of that, sir. a seed now. A little bitty old seed right. chasing a great big old mountain. And it's all figurative because you might have a mountain in your life of pain Preach, or debt or Preach. fear or depression and it says mm. it won't move, but the simplicity of a faith seed will chase a mountain. Yes, sir. And we, we got to praising God and God said, don't just praise me for what I've done. He said, praise me for things that haven't even haven't happened, happened yet. yet. Praise me for things that haven't even happened yet. That's a word. That is a word. You understand what I'm saying? That's a right now word. Now, now what happened was, and, and what the church didn't know, some of them were clapping because, because they were in the service. And if, if you were in the 11 o'clock service, you know, in the 8 o'clock service, they, God did something completely different in that service too. Right. But, but what happened was, after that, I had a meeting. I had to go to another meeting and, and went from the priest at 8 o'clock, priest at 11 o'clock, and then I had a meeting with the master's commission after that. And while I was at the meeting, I got a phone call that my son had been in a wreck. My Lord. He'd been in a wreck and, and almost totaled his car. Mm. And he called me on the phone and he was worried about his car, mm. but he was fine. He was fine. And I said, don't worry about the car because you're fine. And, yes, and, and then I, I got ready to say, thank you, G. He said, um, you already thanked me for that. Don't, 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 don't. Ah, you already thanked me for that. Oh. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you see what I'm saying? I hear you. He said, he said, that's what I had you thanking me for. Yes, sir. When you stand up in the pulpit, and I wouldn't let you preach. Yes, sir. And while you were thanking me, I've already dispatched an angels. And that's why your son isn't dead. Because you call those things that are not as, as though they were. were. And, and I'm, I'm a Christian. No, no, I'm no, not no, supposed no, to no, preach, but I no, tell you no. something, baby. I tell you, see, I tell you something. I wish somebody would go to thanking God in here right now. I dare you to start thanking him for something you need God to do. I double dare you to start. I double dare you to start thanking God. Bishop, my God in heaven. There is, there is an anointing of praise that is flowing through this place. And if you are in your home, you need to just lift up your hands and start thanking God for what you have asked him for. Yes. There, 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 there's, you know, I, I just, I heard something and we, we need to keep praising, but I heard something that I've got, I got to say, while you, there are so many examples in the scripture of where Jesus worked somewhere else mm -hmm. while somebody was in his presence yes. giving him thanks. Yes. And just like what you're saying right now, you weren't there. Right. You were in the presence of God. Right. But he was over there working. That's right. While you were praising. And somebody watching us right now, there's a situation that you can't go to. Uh -huh. But if you'll praise God right where you are. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See? Yes, sir. Go God is going to go to yes, preach, man. Yes, I, I, just, yes, I just... You see? Hey! Uh, excuse me. Hey! You got to excuse
Excuse me, I've just... No, no, no. Hey! Uh, hey! Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Yeah, level, oh, shot! Hey! Thank you! And, uh, Woo. I feel that. Oh, uh, God. See, and, and, and I know, I know, it, it, it might not seem like, it might not seem like this has anything to do with manpower. Right. But I'm talking about the blessings of having a saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled daddy. Because while I was saying, thank you, Jesus, yes, like sir, that, I hear you. God was moving for my children. Because of what you were doing. Because of what Papa was up there. Now, hear this, hear this. And, and, and you were talking about God getting the man by the handle and raising him up. Yeah. When, when, when the man starts moving in the realm of the Spirit, sometimes he may not even know what he's doing. Uh. But if you just praise God, when God says, praise me, he'll deliver your whole family. He'll deliver your family. He'll deliver your family. Yes, sir. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Jesus. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream Dream dreams. dreams. And and, and so I just believe, I just believe that there is a strong anointing. There's no doubt about that. And and I believe that, that God is calling together his sons and bringing us together so that we can counsel together and so that we can strengthen one another yes, so that we can face our challenges and we do have challenges we do have problems we do have faults but none of them are so bad that God doesn't love us right right he right. loves us like you love your children you know your children have faults and, and as they live on they find out you have faults right love supersedes all of that yes sir and so I, I want to challenge men I want the, the Christians the, the godly the prayer the upright, and I want the other brothers, the right. other brothers, yeah. Slick Willie and Dirty Danny and yeah. Freaking Freddie and Jumping Jimmy. I want all of them. I want all. I do. Yes. Where else are they gonna go if we run them out of the church? Where else where? will they go? Right, Bishop. You know, and and so it's exciting. And I don't want you to be intimidated. You don't have to be Pentecostal. You don't have to be African American. You don't have to clap or shout. You can sit there in your seat. I don't care who you are, what kind of man you are. If anything that we've said tonight resonates in your spirit, yeah. if, if, if you're all dressed up acting like a daddy and wishing you had one, if you're trying to carry the weight of, of where you work and the weight of who you're married to or the weight of your kids or the weight of anything on you and you wish there was somebody bigger than you you could go to, why don't you come to Manpower, Jesus. get in this meeting, allow the Holy Spirit to do some things in your life and touch you and bless you and strengthen you and, and build you up. And if you can't come, if you can't come, get the tapes, get the materials, get in the Word of God, go to your church and start getting developing men's groups and ministries. Jesus. If you're a woman, start getting ready for, for Woman Hour at Loose. Jesus. Get the Woman Hour at Loose Bible and start studying it. Listen, listen, we, we got to have a breakthrough, not in church. I'm not worried about a breakthrough in church. We need a breakthrough in the house. We need a breakthrough up in that house, you know? And so, I, 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 go ahead. No, I, I'm just, I, I, don't even, I, don't, I don't even want to cut you off because there's such a flow here going. But I, I just, if you can get anywhere near the reunion arena, get there. I, I am sitting next to this man and it's hard to sit here, okay? So I, 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 that anointing is going to be flowing, and, uh, and you need to be, sir, listen to me. This, this is the answer you've been asking for. You need to make it to manpower this week. Can you say thank you with me to Bishop T.D. Jake? For what? There's another roll in. There's one more blip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just give them more information about manpower. My God. Thank God for it. Love you. <laughs> Bishop, there, there's there's one more there's one more clip we, we have about manpower, a little more information. You it, will just, it will just give them information and I'm getting ready to go. It's it's been a pleasure to be w- with you tonight. My, I, my, I love you with all of my heart. Thank I thank you, God sir. for what he's doing in your life thank and in you, your sir. ministry. And it's just a pleasure to uh, share this moment with you. In my honor. I, I, I believe God with all of my heart that the things that we said, even if the persons can't come at all, I believe somebody got blessed just watching this tonight. I, I, just, I just believe that. I, I agree with you. I'm yeah. no doubt about it. I,